Hello and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Luke DeWolf. And I'm Dan Larrabee. Today we continue our series on the Kalevala with Kalevala Runo 3, Vainamarinen and Jokahainen. Before we get into that, just a little bit of a recap of our last episode. So the world was created, our last Kalevala episode, we've had others between that anyway. Uh, the world has been created and Vainamarinen has essentially discovered out agriculture and mastered it and now well that's a very short recap now we're basically getting into the actual narrative of the poem and uh yeah we're we're going to start to get into the stories and the interpersonal relationships that kind of make up the the bulk of the call of all and this is the beginning of a of a cycle of of a few runos that are all related and based on kind of the same theme so sounds good i'm uh, i'm excited to uh get started and uh, dive in yeah perfect so before we just jump right in with this uh we do want to say and uh bear with us on this uh the biggest thing you can do to help support us support the podcast if you're on itunes or apple Podcasts, we really appreciate a review it goes a long way to more people checking out the show so that's a really big help for us there if you're on youtube we'd really appreciate if you subscribe or like the video or anything like that we appreciate comments as well try and get to every comment we get so and uh yeah if you didn't know about our youtube channel as well we've been doing a lot of clips we have a, a weekly have them all posts that we make and uh we try and get a lot of interesting clips from our shows that are kind of on one topic and informative so we're doing that and if you're watching on youtube and you didn't know we're also a podcast so we're available on itunes stitcher google play pretty much every podcast app spotify so yeah and share with your friends if you don't mind that as well that's uh, a big deal to us too absolutely yeah all that would be uh greatly appreciated by us any or all that's the biggest way you can support us at this point so uh yeah thank you for listening and uh now we'll just get to it now that we're uh you know done all the housekeeping's out of the way now it's time for fun exactly there we go perfect okay so we'll just dive into it this is kalavala runo three vainamunen and yoka Start as usual here we we don't have uh you know stanzas like in the uh the poetic edit or anything like that so we're going to be going by line numbers and i'll do my best to let you know where we're kind of going with that and oh uh just as a reminder here we're using uh the translation by wf kirby it's freely available it's you know, in the public domain i've yeah i'm just showing you the the for those of you on youtube the the version here uh, yeah, we're using a, a version that's available freely on Amazon. I know there's a Kindle version. Uh, yeah, it's a very good translation if you want to follow along, but pretty well every translation is going to have the same line numbering and everything like that. So you should be good no matter which one you get if you want to follow along. So, okay, yeah, let's get into it. This is going to be lines 1 to 16. Back to the poem. Vainamainen. Old and steadfast, past the days of his existence, where lie Vainala's sweet meadows, Kalevala's extended heathlands. There he sang his songs of sweetness, sang his songs and proved his wisdom. Day by day he sang unwearied. Night by night discoursed unceasing, sang the songs of bygone ages, hidden words of ancient wisdom. Songs which all the children sing not, all beyond men's comprehension. In these ages of misfortune, when the race is near its ending. So this is interesting because we're getting kind of a a gloomy vision of where things are. Like it, it's it sounds like things are are going to be coming to an end and wrapping up and i think as we uh, go through the calavella we'll, that's sort of how things will go but you'll see a major shift in something uh no spoilers because i actually don't know i just have i have an inkling of where it's going um 
but you know, looking at what's going on right now, we've got uh, a Vinemoinen. He is proving his wisdom. He's singing songs of bygone ages, so he's kind of remembering what uh, what's gone on, and it's kind of the the function of of civilization. It's holding that that assumed knowledge that people would just be, and that we all take for granted that as we go about our day. So he he's actually singing it, and he's seems to be singing songs that sort of go back to when all of the things that we take for granted actually were, were brought forth. And the, I would imagine in these songs, they have the reasoning for it. And it's like, we don't, we don't necessarily know all of the, uh, all of the intricacies of why things are the way they are, even though like Western civilization is pretty good at, at maintaining its history and, be having it available to go back to so that you can you can read it and rejuvenate civilization um but i i think that's what we're seeing here is that like even us we don't have we don't often go all the way back to the beginning to figure out you know why we do the things that we do the way that we do them and we still have like people coming up with so-called and i'm using air quotes if you're not watching on youtube uh, like new ideas that so-called new ideas that have been proven time and time again to to fail horribly and usually end in uh, many many people dying. So uh, we're just see, we're we're seeing what we're seeing is that Vinamwinen has all that all of this at his fingertips and is able to keep the integrity of this old ancient wisdom. Right, and I, and I mean the the thing about it is that he is preserving that connection to the past in in a way that goes beyond like they're saying it's the, it's the songs that are beyond men's comprehension so he he's really tapping into a level of wisdom that it, it's it's really weird here the timing because we go from in runo 1 and 2 which are creation myths two different kinds of creation myths but they're both that's what they are and then we go into this and and essentially like he's He's keeping that connection to the past, but we don't we don't really have much kind of in, in between. It's almost like we've skipped an entire age. You know what I mean? Like we we've skipped over the age that you know maybe in in other traditions would be considered say that golden age or something like that. We've we've kind of glossed over it. Not to say that others don't like in uh, in the poetic and in the Boluspa when they when they go over the few stances about the golden age kind of at the beginning there. That that's not a, a long section, but they they enunciate it more clearly than here. Versus we're now kind of in if we're near the end of of an age, what what to me that says I think this is intentional. It's something like we're actually at a part where some action's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like that, it, it doesn't, you don't get into an exciting story when everything is good and it's peacetime. We're, we're near the end of something changing and that's going to kind of happen here. But I, I like to just emphasize here that the Vandermeinen is, he's practicing his craft. He's a bard. He continues to work at it and get better. He sings, he sings, he sings. This is, theoretically what he is on in the world to do something like that like he is the you know the the immortal bard or something it's not immortal he, he he's described as a bard like continually here right and yeah he he continues to practice he continues to get better and he continues to to draw that line with tradition right so it's it's kind of like a continual thing he's b constantly building on and improving on that which has been laid down in the past. And I think that's, this is really short and this is just in the beginning here. And th this isn't even at all what this poem focuses on. And it's kind of funny how it just kind of glances over that, but that's a big deal. And it it emphasizes that Vainamoinen is a hero to me. Definitely. And I really like that uh, that link you made with uh, Vainamoinen being sort of the, the carrier of tradition and, and it being at that that later age where things are going to change uh, the, the two lines songs, which all the children sing, not and all beyond men's comprehension. 
it, it sounds to me like they've gotten to this point where the children no longer no longer sing the songs of their of their own tradition and you know the men don't understand the songs anymore they don't there's been a break somewhere and you can tell that there's going to be a drastic change right it's uh it's interesting i I mean again none of this is really explicit beyond those those things here and we we do have some concept of known and unknown in the in the previous couple of episodes we we have talked about the distinction between Kalavala and Polhila. So they have a, a concept of known and unknown. They have a concept of order and chaos. And we, we've seen that at work a little bit too, but it's it's not really kind of come to a head as it were. So I think we're going to see some of that as we go here. And, and certainly as the Kalavala progresses even beyond this particular runo. So are you okay? To- I, I am. Let's uh, Let's move on. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this will be lines 17 to 40. We're going to be reading some long sections this time here. It's uh, very poetic and lots of good plot, but we'll be reading some long chunks, just, just saying. Back to the poem. Far away the news was carried. Far abroad was spread the tidings of the songs of Vainamunen, of the wisdom of the hero. In the south was spread the rumor, reached to Pohyola, the tidings. Here dwelt youthful Yokahainen, he, the meager youth of Lapland. And when visiting the village, wondrous tales he heard related, how there dwelt another minstrel, and that better songs were caroled, far in Bainala's sweet meadows, Kalavala's extended heathlands. Better songs than he could compass, better than his father taught him. This he heard with great displeasure, and his heart was filled with envy that the songs of Vainamunin better than his own were reckoned. Then he went to seek his mother, sought her out the aged woman, and declared that he would journey, and was eager to betake him unto Vainala's far dwellings, that he might contend with Vaina. So I actually really like this sort of introduction to it because it just gets right in and you know the, you know, uh, Yoka Heinen's uh, motivations right away. And it's, I would actually say, so he's set up as the the antagonist or the adversary of Vindemwinen, but what he's doing is sort of what he's supposed to do as a young man. He is supposed to go out and find challenges test his metal, test his skills and his abilities up against something so that he can get a measure of himself and, and ultimately improve. Now, as we'll see, I, I think he's going to go about it in the, in the wrong way, but the, the initial drive to go out and, and beat find them in, in singing, I, I think is a, it is actually like a good thing. It's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to try and, and, you know, best others and be better than we are um as well i want to talk a little bit about the importance of him talking about the uh the songs that are are better than the songs that his father taught him that's uh that's huge that is without a a word of exaggeration that's kind of that exact section here is basically like why we had the cold war it's you you have competing ways of understanding the world and when you're introduced to a new way usually the reaction especially if it's like diametrically opposed is to go and one prove why your way of life is better but it often also ends in war and and this i mean this isn't going to be a, a spoiler but they are going to have a have a battle over over their songs and it uh and, and it might sound it might sound like an exaggeration that oh like why would why would he care that much about songs and how can you compare that to something like the cold war but when you have when you take someone's understanding of the world and how it how everything around them works and then you you shake it and say no that's not it 
you're taking away basically everything from them and reducing them to you're taking their the borders of their explored territory and you're you're reducing it to just what's around them and maybe not even that they're they're back to you know being lost in the jungle and the the beginning stage of of people is not that you know oh i'm comfortable in the society because it's it's wonderful it's you know being overcome by terror in the dark because you don't know what's out there and there there is very likely things that will eat you or kill you or both you know so having that challenged is very much like an it's an existential threat in in the fullest way to understand that it it's not just your your body and your life but also the way you understand the world and the way you look at it and everything about your own identity so in some ways that's why he's going out to to confront Vinamwen because everything that his father has taught him well Vinamwen is singing about a, a different better way to do it well that's <laughs> that's not cool he's he's going to show that his father's way is actually the better way of doing it right and and I like that you you tied it the idea of songs to the well you say, you know, how would you compare songs to the Cold War? You know, the funny thing about this is we have to remember that this is all supposed to be sung. The way all this oral tradition was passed down was through singing. This this poetry, this distillation of their culture in general came into song. And so when we when we have that in the context of this poem, I think that even goes beyond the idea of what we understand as as simply music. And I'm one to First of all, say like there's no such thing as simply music. There's something to music that that goes beyond, for me anyway, that goes beyond, you know, just the sum of its parts. There's something else there. But this stuff, I think it even goes beyond that. It goes to the place of this is like all the wisdom of a of a people passed down through generations. And I mean, even today, Finland remains an extremely musical country. It's got the most metal bands per capita of any country by a significant margin. And the other Scandinavian countries are kind of up there too, but like, yeah, not close to, to Finland. So just, just saying, and uh, yeah, so that connection I thought was, was right on as far as like, that's the distillation of their, cultures and, and and just remember here Paul Hilla is the well it's the equivalent of Jotunheim in the Norse as far as I'm concerned anyway maybe not like specifically but symbologically shorthand if we want to go there anyway that's that's that but it, it says that Jokahainen comes from a different tribe essentially than Bainamun and he comes from a different group of people from a different place and so, yeah, they would have competing ideas. And so the the fact that he is hearing these different songs that are better, you know, it's, there's a different attitude that Yoko Heine could take as far as if he hears these better songs, he could try to incorporate them and learn them and make something out of them, right? You know, that that's, I think, the idea of improving on the situation of your own culture, like being better than the songs that his father taught him would be an opportunity for okay let's let's improve upon the traditions that we've we've built but no as as you said he's he's going for like no i don't like that you're singing songs that are better i'm going to show you i think that's the attitude and then again he like he he goes to to seek his mother i think that's a different point altogether where he's he's uh almost returning to the the comforts of home to get propped up something like that that's that's kind of how i see that and i just wanted to make a note as far as the name of yokohainen it it's not really um agreed upon what his name actually means the the few that i've seen as far as translations goes could be related to yokea uh a word for tall um yoku uh i th- believe this one is a, a Sami word for snow or ice. It could also relate to a, a word uh, which means white swan something like that. That's one of the more interesting ones but these are just all a bunch of possibilities as far as you know, what his name 
might mean. So as far as all that goes, I don't want to speculate as far as which one might be actually correct. But either way, just so that, uh, you know, we're actually dealing with his name a little bit and not letting that go. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. I had no idea that Finland had the uh, highest per capita level of uh, metal bands. That's that's something to be proud of for Finland, for sure. Yeah, by a margin. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm good to move on. If you are, yeah, perfect. This is uh, it's it's a it's good for setting the scene, though. Like it, it really establishes how Vainamunen and Jokahainen are are going to be kind of at odds with each other here. So, uh, next one is going to be a little bit short here. So just forty one to fifty lines, forty one to fifty. Back to the poem. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Sorry about that. Back to the poem, for real now. But his father straight forbade him, both his father and his mother, thence to Vainela to journey that he might contend with Vaina. He will surely sing against you, sing against you and will ban you, sink your mouth and head in snowdrifts and your hands in bitter tempest, till your hands and feet are stiffened and incapable of motion. So this is actually kind of the the very typical response of uh, parents when their kids want to go out and do something that's uh, risky. It's parents obviously love their children and don't want to see uh, harm come to them, so they're they're discouraging him from uh, going out against Vinamwin and, and and sort of meeting him in musical battle. Um. And I, I think in some ways, too, it's a, a way for, if we sort of abstract this, it's the, the culture's way of kind of protecting itself because it's not, they, if, you, if you don't go out and bother another culture, they might just leave you alone as well. And, and it won't show you that there are better ways of doing things as, as we've established with vinyl and singing. So it, it'll keep the, it'll keep the culture intact. If he sort of sticks to sticks to home and does the things that he's supposed to do at home rather than going out for an adventure. However, I think it's worth noting that that's one of the, I think the dichotomies of parenting and having a culture is that, one, you want your children to be safe, but at the same time, you don't want to stifle them. So you, you actually do want them to go out and see the world and, and be be exposed to new ideas and new situations, all that kind of thing. So it's it, you're kind of you're kind of weighing how do how do I keep my kids safe versus how do I make sure that they don't you know wither and you know die kind of thing. So. Right. And I mean, I, I think this is kind of an inflection point where I got tripped up. There was uh, that the segue isn't very good. But yeah, they're, they're, they're saying <clears throat> to Yoka Heinen that he should not go out and contend with with Vinamunian, right? And, and this is like, this is something here. The culture seems to be too cautious at this point. And, and Yoka Heinen could do something about that. He, he could go out into the unknown and bring back something positive to invigorate his culture and maybe that maybe that is what's kind of implied here by his doing that he's he's going to go out there and do that but you know they're making the point here that he is not able to contend with this force and i think that's the idea he wants to go adversarial like that is his intention he wants to go adversarially against these new ideas and and maybe that does also speak on some level to this is this is a a family even if just on that level just a family that is a little bit rotten there's something going on there that's that's not great and we will get to that more here in this stanza but as far as them having a comparable level of culture that cannot tend with what cannot contend with what Vainamunin is is bringing to the table, but then also at the same time, they're 
their youth, their younger generation, which is supposed to take up the mantle of the hero and get out there and go out into the unknown and do this stuff. But, you know, maybe he's doing it the wrong way. And maybe that's how his culture has raised him, something like that. I've, I've got a thread here. It's not complete, but I think that's just something I, maybe to bear in mind as we go forward as far as Yoko Heinen's intentions. Those are really important as we go on here as far as his role in this poem. Absolutely. I've been trying to think too of the the relationship between the father and the and the mother, um, sort of in relation to the, the symbols of one being sort of tradition and the other part being that that new life and sort of that chaotic the what is undifferentiated chaos that uh, could be good or bad. But if you, I guess it. <laughs> I think it should probably worry a culture if if both are saying the same thing because I think the power is that when you have they should balance each other out they shouldn't be both be pulling in the same direction I think is the uh the key that might be the 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 rotting part actually yeah i i think I think you're enunciating it a bit better i I think it it's something to do with they are stagnated and there isn't that infusion of operating on the boundary of order and chaos there if yoko heinen goes out into the unknown that could be a good thing here but he wants to contend with him and possibly prove that he's better yeah maybe maybe that's something about like a culture or a family or just a tradition something like that 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 thinks it's the best but it's not really there yeah, I, I've got some some things that are going through my head now, but uh, certainly that weren't there when I was first going through my notes or anything like that. So maybe, maybe this will come out as we go here. But, For sure. Uh, should we yeah, continue? Yeah, let's go on. All right. This will be lines 51 to 66. Back to the poem. Said the youthful Yokohainen, good the counsel of my father and my mother's counsel better. Best of all, my own opinion. I will set myself against him and defy him to a contest. I myself, my songs will sing him. I myself will speak my mantras. Sing until the best of minstrels shall become the worst of singers. Shoes of stone will I provide him, wooden trousers on his haunches. On his breast a stony burden and a rock upon his shoulders. Stony gloves his hands shall cover, and his head a stony helmet. So we have, the again, a very typical response. So Yoko Heinen has gone to his parents. Parents have said, you know, no, we don't want you going out. And then Yoko Heinen says, well, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want anyway. And, uh, and then he, he describes, how, really, it's, it's kind of boasting, and it's, and it's very typical of that that sort of young man boasting, where it's like, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and he's not going to know what's, what's going to hit him, and all this kind of stuff. And I love the, uh, I love sort of the poetry here, the shoes of stone, wooden trousers, and basically, he's going to weigh him down and if you're wearing all these things that he's describing, you're not going to be able to move. You're going to be weighed down. And and I think in some ways that's, that's how he's going to show how powerful his culture is because he's going to basically stop the other one in its tracks with, with his wisdom and his song. So he's going to show that, you know, his is moving into the future and it's great, but you know, and Vinamwin is going to be stuck there, just not not being able to do anything, and he'll become, you know, the worst of singers. Yeah, and, and you know that there's an arrogance to this. There's an arrogance and an ignorance because I mean, he he says, you know, his his father and his mother's counsel is good, but his is better. And I mean, this is just the arrogance of youth, right? This is like, you know, if, if you're a kid, then you think you know everything about the world when you 
know essentially nothing about the world. I mean, that's that's this. That's Yoka Heinen. I mean, we established at the beginning of this poem. Again, it was it was short, and it doesn't emphasize it nearly enough. But Vainamunen, he's singing all the best songs. He's singing the entirety of the wisdom of all of these. Uh, the, the entire culture, right? The the culture of Vainala, the culture of Kalavala. He's he's singing everything. He's got all this wisdom, and here's Yoka Heinen who thinks he is going to best him. And I mean, yeah, just to just to have that thought in your head and that be your intention. Like this is this is really like he's he's going about this just in in such a way that he's almost setting himself up for failure. Like we're already seeing it here. This again, this, this isn't a spoiler. Like he's, he's setting him up to go against the top guy, right? The top bard. He's going against that. And I mean, yeah, with that, with that intention, like, what are you going to do? You know? Oh, for sure. It, it reminds me a lot actually of like, well, basically young people at any time, you know, in the, uh, you get a bit of education in them and th- this isn't a knock on education but like you know they, they go to university in the first like first year university and all of a sudden you know oh if only we were you know anarcho-socialists i mean look at this you know book that i read and you know it doesn't i remember uh one of my profs someone was i think recommending that for or um some sort of anarcho something or other for uh, Africa to solve all the problems in Africa. And of course, like this one, you know, this one student in second year, he, he's got, he's got it solved. And the prof is just like, yeah, this, I don't even know if this looks good on paper, but tr- like, if you're going to try and bring that into the real world, like it's going to, it's going to fall apart. And the kid was like, oh, well, I, I don't know. And like, it was just <sighs> the arrogance of youth, just like right there. And I think we're all, we're all guilty of it in some ways when we're young, because, you know, some of us are like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to change the world this way. It's like, well, probably not. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, I think that is the metaphor that we're kind of getting at here, how the new generation goes about challenging the existing order. And I mean, I think we're, that's, that is getting ahead of ourselves. I think we, we will revisit that point but it it really is something like he is challenging the accumulated wisdom of thousands and thousands of years the entirety of the culture he thinks he's going to beat it so that's just the attitude of yoka Heinen at this point and uh yeah i mean we're we're not talking up his chances all that highly and i mean Again, I don't want to give anything away here, but that's his intention. Anyway, he's going up against the top guy. Good idea, Yoka Heinen. Exactly. And it's not to say that his intention of going up against tradition is bad because it's it, it's not. It's actually like good to look at traditions and, you know, try and grow from it, but he's looking at overthrowing it and like that and that's the difference. He wants to overthrow it rather than sort of grow it, adapt it, up, even update it. Like, Well, yeah, they, it, we already saw here that these songs are better than the ones his father taught him. I mean, again, it all comes down to intentions where he's got the, he's got a number of ways of dealing with it, and the one he picks is to go destroy it. And yeah, it, it's all about his intention. That's, that is really what is indicating what's going to happen here. And with that... Let's move on. Let's move on. All right. Lines 67 to 100. Back to the poem. Then he went his way unheeding, went his way and fetched his gelding, from whose mouth the fire was flashing, neath whose legs the sparks were flying. Then the fiery steed he harnessed. To the golden sledge he yoked him, in the sledge himself he mounted, and upon the seat he sat him. O'er the horse's whip he brandished, with the beaded whip he smote him. From the place the horse sprang quickly, and he darted lightly forwards. 
On he drove with thundering clatter, as he drove a day a second, driving also on the third day, and at length upon the third day came to Vainala's sweet meadows, Kalavala's extended heathlands. Vainamainen, old and steadfast, he the oldest of magicians, as it chanced was driving onward peacefully his course pursuing, on through Vainala's sweet meadows. Kalavala's extended heathlands. Came the youthful Yokahainen, driving on the road against him, and the shafts were wedged together and the reins were all entangled, and the collar jammed with collar and the runners dashed together. Thus their progress was arrested, thus they halted and reflected. Sweat dropped down upon the runners. From the shafts the steam was rising. So I would say everything that we set up in the previous section, we're really seeing it now. He he just got on his horse, and I love the imagery of the the fire was flashing, the lakes were sparking. It, I think, it just really shows you how how gung ho uh, Yuka Yukainen was. He's, you know, he he's ready to go. He's looking for a fight. He's full of uh, passion and just. He can't wait to get there. And then he, he rides for days on end. And then doesn't even like go up to Vinamoin and say, hey, you know, I don't like your singing. He just crashes into him. Just if that isn't if that isn't youth trying to overthrow the system that has raised them and everything before them for thousands of years, I don't know what is. Like that is and it's so it's so clever that the the story is able to illustrate that very thing, even though it's you know far removed from our time. Like, I I don't think I'm going too far to say that you know the younger generation always is trying to change things, and and rightfully so, and this is just one of the ways that they try and change things, especially when they're young, and they're literally just crashing themselves into it with reckless abandon as if that's going to do something well yeah and i mean we'll see if that does anything good but but no you're you're right and i mean it's all of his intentions like he's yeah I, the the imagery is, is great like it's 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 very much getting his personality his goals his intentions and by the way, and is just going on peacefully right like he is pursuing his path which i think is this is supposed to be the example of the proper way to do things. The way I see it in general, the way Vainamainen is here is the way to properly go about things, which is, you know, to to keep doing his thing. He's He's got a good thing going. He's reciting wisdom and practicing his craft. Like, he's he's digging into the wisdom of tradition, but he is also practicing his craft and going forward. Like, it's it, it's again it's all simple it's all these really really short little sentences lines whatever you want to call it but it just the the way they describe Vainamoon and it's like he's doing everything right in order to progress and here comes Yokohan and crashing into him and i mean that's that's really the point here is that Yokohan has just gone and crashed into Vainamoon without really even you, you know well, as you said, like he's he's not doing it politely. He's he's not he's not having any regard for what Vainamoinen might be doing. He's and he has no regard for the possible good that Vainamoinen could be doing by being on this path. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Like he's he's got no regard for the good things that the tradition and wisdom that Vainamoinen has kept up and has practiced. He has no regard for the good things that they might be doing again not to say that the change is is a bad thing but it, it it's also just the idea of completely ignoring all that tradition right exactly yeah it's it's kind of like you know you kind and he wants change and he wants it now but you know, what does he want to change well i i don't know i just want it to be different well okay what are you gonna do well i'm gonna wreck stuff like <laughs> Exactly. That seems to be the only thing he's uh, he's got going on here. He's causing a literal car crash, a, a sleigh crash. 
you know, it's all the horses are entangled and yeah, not, not a good situation, but let's see how Vanderman and, uh, reacts. Sounds good. All right. Lines 101 to 120. Back to the poem. Ask the aged Vainamunin, who are you and what your lineage, you who drive so reckless onward utterly without reflection? Broken are the horses' collars and the wooden runners likewise. You have smashed my sledge to pieces, broke the sledge in which I traveled. Then the youthful Yokohainen answered in the words which follow, I am youthful Yokohainen. But yourself should also tell me what your race and what your nation and from what vile stock you issue. Vainamunin, old and steadfast, told his name without concealment and began to speak as follows. Youth, if you are Yokohainen, you should move aside a little, for remember, you are younger. So we've got their, you know, sort of the opening of their uh, their conflict. He's Yokohainen and smashed the sleds, and now Vinamoinen is ticked off and being like, "What are you? What are you doing? You're you're wrecking stuff here." Um, and it's, I would say, the symbols of, let's say, novelty and tradition are really starting to like crystallize here because. You can see, you can see basically in any movie where there's a conflict between like an old curmudgeon and you know a young person trying to show them the new way. Like this exact conversation happens in different ways. Like, um, <laughs> have you ever seen the movie Gran Torino? I haven't. No. With the uh, oh no 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 yes I have with Clint Eastwood. Yeah yeah, yeah yeah yeah. So if you if you want a good example of that kind of relationship, although it it works out better and kind of shows how you're supposed to uh, do it the opposite way of Yukon. And like, that's a movie to go check out because it's, it's perfect for that. Yeah. So we have like, it's awesome. Cause you have Vine and Wynn using like the term youth at, almost as an insult, like you young dummy. Whereas Yukon is like, I'm youthful, like as if that is great. And again, youth, there are definitely benefits to youth, but there's something, you know, something powerful about tradition. And, and the reason why it's powerful is that it's worked. I mean, that, that's the only thing about tradition that, well, one makes it tradition, but also makes it powerful is that it has worked to orient people in the world and to keep them alive and safe long enough to live and procreate and that's no small feat at all like if you look in the animal kingdom like growing up an animals growing up to uh to procreate again and keep the species going you know there are tons of species that have to have you know thousands or hundreds or thousands of babies just just in the hopes that some of them survive until into adulthood and are able to procreate. Well, <laughs> humans don't have the, uh, the benefit of creating, you know, dozens and hundreds or thousands of offspring. Like there, there you've got this sort of short window and, you know, a short window of, of time of fertility and of like, it takes time to actually like grow a baby and then, you know, give birth and then get it up to adulthood. So these things are the like time tested lessons to make sure that the human race continues on. And that's, that's no joke. That's nothing to scoff at. And that's sort of the, that's sort of the joke of youth is that they're going to, you know, rail against all these, all these traditions, which are exactly the reasons why they're alive and able to rail against them. Yeah, it, exactly. And I mean, I think for for me, you know, when, when I was in kind of this phase, because I, and I mean, you know, I'll just acknowledge I'm, I'm closer to this phase of my life than I am to Vayner phase of his life anyway. But, 
you know, when I was firmly in that camp, I think there was there was an idea of I can see things from this new perspective and all the information is there. You just have to kind of go read the first paragraph of the Wikipedia entry and then you understand the entire thing. Right. But, but, but I'm, I'm being serious about that one. Like it's, it's like there's a new perspective and a new vitality here. And through that, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a youth. I am going to do better here, but yeah, completely ignorant of, completely ignorant of all the things that keep him alive that was that was a good way of putting it but no and I, I mean Diana Marinen is is absolutely i think doing the right thing here in the sense like he's he's calling him out on it it's like the the tradition and the culture is pushing back this is almost a parallel to you know the the political well the political sphere in general where it's like you you get the right as as a concept is the guardian of tradition that's like the the nice way to talk about you know conservatives and the right and things like that they they value tradition very highly and and sometimes certainly to the to the detriment of new information and all that and that's of course it mirrors the archetypes really well etc cetera, etc cetera. you know we've we've covered this ground but then you get the the left and progressives and uh, not classical liberals, but yeah, and then and, and they embody the new perspective. And again, it's all just about how it's done. Like I, I don't want to sound like I'm taking a side here, especially in terms of politics. It's it's more like the the attitude in which they're going about it. Vandermeer is saying like, okay, like who are you? What are you doing? And Jokaheinen is, you know, I'm I'm going to well, he, well, he he even goes like. What, from what vile stock do you issue? Like he's going for like hardcore. Well, that goes beyond name calling. He's going for insulting. Like he's saying, you and all the things that that made you are wrong, are vile, right? You know, in in terms of the way everything is is going, it's their attitudes. It's not it's not the purpose because. Again, Vandermeer is also embodying aspects of the hero, where he is practicing his craft and he's going, he's progressing. Like he, he's going in his sledge. Like that's that's directional movement. He's he's doing something. He's not stagnant like like a lot of political parties on the right these days. You know, certainly would embody that. They're very stagnant and very set in tradition and everything like that. And anything new is bad, right? Versus. You, you know, here he is actually embodying elements of the hero, and Jokaheinen could embody the elements of the hero, but he's he's choosing intentionally in his youthfulness and his ignorance and his arrogance to go against or the the established order instead of working with with it to invigorate it. You know, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a a great way of putting it. I'm totally on board for that. Yeah, and it's gonna get worse definitely so we'll move on sounds good okay this will be lines 121 to 134 back to the poem but the youthful yokohainen answered in the words which follow here of youthfulness we reck not not doth youth or age concern us he who highest stands in knowledge he whose wisdom is the greatest. Let him keep the path before him, and the other yield the passage. If you are old, Vainamunin, and the oldest of the minstrels, let us give ourselves to singing. Let us now repeat our sayings, that the one may teach the other, and the one surpass the other. So it, it's interesting because... Yes, we're sort of seeing a metaphorical battle between sort of tradition and I almost don't want to call uh and progress because I, I think that be, I think it, you know, uh, makes progress sound worse than it has to. Maybe like reckless progress or progress for progress sake or change for change's sake i like that but uh you actually have him challenging 
like the knowledge and wisdom of tradition versus this new and you know I, I can hear some you know newfangled wisdom kind of thing which is exactly how how it works in society like it's barely a symbol here it's just yes this is how it goes like you you don't have to uh there's no abstraction here it's just directly mappable so that's uh that's one of one of the things i like and one of the interesting things actually with uh singing being sort of the the medium and i guess one it, it is a medium and for like finished stories they're sung but also in the contest between tradition and and let's say unmitigated progress like sharing that knowledge is sort of how it would go so yeah it's a very interesting you know barely it's barely symbolic which i really like right and i'm and i mean previously here he's gone and said you know like he's 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 gone for the name calling he's gone for all the negatives here but now he's got a valid point like yeah let's put the ideas up against one another that's exactly right let's let's have a discourse let's talk about things let's put ideas up against one another like good like i this is this section here i was going in one direction when i was thinking about kind of how things were going on my first couple of readings here but then this is like yeah that's exactly right that's how you should go about it but it's also the case of well why are you doing this here when you've already crashed the car when you've already crashed the sleighs into one another when you've already gone for the the negatives these attacks and everything like that i mean good on him there i i won't say that's that's a thing to discourage right but it's also a case of like he could have gone about everything in a completely different way and still pitted the ideas against one another and it's almost like he doesn't want to do the work of proving that his ideas are good and worthwhile he just wants to right now overthrow the established order and get his ideas to the front absolutely i think i was going to talk a little bit about uh the symbolism of of singing and uh and magic because it, there's an understanding here and they'll get to it in a bit but that it's magical singing but actually i think i'll uh I'll save that for uh, when we really get into the meat of it. Well, good withholding, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on here. This will be lines 135 to 146. Back to the poem. Vainamunen, old and steadfast, answered in the words which follow. What can I myself accomplish as a wise man or a singer? I have passed my life in quiet here among these very moorlands, on the borders of my home field, I have heard the cuckoo calling. But apart from this at present, I will ask you to inform me what may be your greatest wisdom and the utmost of your knowledge. And so we have Vainamoinen, who is, is tradition, at least in the interpretation that we're going with. And he, he's asking, okay, what are your, what are these new ideas? Which I think is like exactly what uh, civilization is supposed to do. It, it's supposed to welcome new ideas and ultimately test them against tradition to see one if they work, and two if they work better. Because you, I mean, something could work and it could be it could be worse, it could not work as well. But what if, like, what if? No, it works and it works better like that's amazing of course like and i i think vinamoyan would absolutely if he found something that worked and worked better would adopt it and and work with it and it and embrace it like it, he doesn't seem to be the type that would hold on to tradition for tradition's sake he he seemed quite willing to to work with new information that might make things better and easier for him so no it's it, it's exactly how culture is supposed to behave right and i mean the the other side to it too is that he's not the one who has to prove himself exactly you know like he is embodying that tradition and yokohainen is the one who's challenging it right so it, it it's exactly right that yokohainen would be the one to, ha to have to explain himself but here it's also a case of like 
what does he have to prove? Like, I mean, he's he has lived in the moment. He's lived in the moment and, you know, he passes life in quiet, right? Like, I think what that also says is like, maybe there's some recognition that, you know, in, in doing that, he hasn't really been out in action. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe there is some implication that there could be some some possibility of new ideas kind of coming in and working. But, you know, the idea that he's he's lived in in the moment though, it's it's something like, you know, he's he's got his goal, his aim, he's going for something, but then he's just living a quiet, contented life. I mean, it paints a picture if he is, if he is a symbol, an example of culture in general, that sounds pretty good, right? Like living a peaceful, quiet life among the moorlands, the borders of his home field, something like that. Like he's, he's got his area and he lives in it and he lives in it peacefully. Things are good, right? So, I mean, what new ideas can improve that, you know? Exactly. As as a culture, I mean, he, he's got the wisdom to, to live peacefully. That is, that in itself is like, it's crazy if you, if you think about it too much, because I'm trying to think like how long has, let's say, let's talk about the West, like, or even in the West, we're fairly peaceful. Like we generally can get up every day and go about our day without any like serious threat to our lives, which is incredible because that, that is a, we can't even say that's 500 years old, like a hundred years old, 200, 250, like, and then there's, I mean, that's not even counting disease and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that once you start throwing that in, like that timeline gets a lot shorter as to when you can just go live your life in relative peace. And I think, I think it shows that that's the, that's the goal of culture and tradition is to orient the world in such a way that people can then live their lives in peace and go about their own sort of personal business without, you know, as long as they aren't sort of disrupting that, that peace and that, that culture. So it, it really shows me that Yuka Heinen is the one who, the onus is on him to show Vinamwin why his his ideas are better. Like, because the standard is quite high. Like, you've got a, a peaceful life where you're living pro- in prosperity. Okay, like things are really good right now. What can you actually do that would make it better? Right, for sure. So, should we see what he has to say? Yes. Okay. Lines one forty seven to one eighty two. Said the youthful Yokohainen, many things I know in fullness, and I know with perfect clearness, and my insight shows me plainly. In the roof we find the smoke hole, and the fire is near the hearthstone. Joyful life, the seal is leading in the waves, there sports the sea dog, and he feeds upon the salmon, and the powans round about him. Smooth the water loved by Powans, smooth the surface too, for salmon, and in frost the pike is spawning, slimy fish in wintry weather, sluggish is the perch, the humpback, in the depths it swims in autumn, but it spawns in drought of summer, swimming slowly to the margin. If this does not yet suffice you, I am wise in other matters, and of weighty things can tell you. In the north, they plow with reindeer. In the south, the mare is useful. And the elk in furthest Lapland. Trees I know on Pisa Mountain. Firs upon the rocks of Horna. Tall the trees on Pisa Mountain and the firs on rocks of Horna. Three great waterfalls I know of and as many lakes extensive. And as many lofty mountains underneath the vault of heaven. Halapura is in Hame. Karyala has Katrakoski. But they do, un- do not match the Vuoksi. There where Imatra is running. So we've got a taste of 
Jokahainen's uh, wisdom, and he's without giving too much away. He's really showing his knowledge, and, I, and I'll give him credit. It, the knowledge that he has is good. He like he's obviously know he knows the the season and cycles of, of uh, when fish are around and what type of fish, which means he he'll be able to feed himself and feed himself well. Uh, he knows uh, some geography that around. So he knows the uh, he knows the physical landscape that he lives in, and he knows how to uh, how to properly use agriculture and what, which animals he's going to need to till the land and all that kind of stuff. So he do, he's got some really great knowledge of of how to live and how to be how to have a peaceful successful life. The the funny part to me is that all of this knowledge was probably given to him by his parents who probably got it from, you know, their parents and that's sort of how you get culture, right? Is that going down you know, through generation through generation, and the lessons learned being passed on. I mean, that that's culture. So he's got all this great knowledge, but it's been directly given to him by the culture that he's railing against. Yeah, and I mean the the thing there too is that everything he's saying is very concrete. Like, I'm sure none of this is news to Vainamunin, right? Oh, I would I would doubt that it is. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. It's it's great that he knows all this stuff and he knows it all extensively, but he doesn't. He's not bringing anything deep yet, right? And and I mean just just to to clarify something here, everything, we, all the Finnish words and stuff that were in there, that yeah, it's it's places. He's he's talking about waterfalls, what types are on of trees are on which mountain, right? Like it's it, there was nothing deeper there. It's it's very um, it's it's very concrete again so it's like as far as what he's doing you know what's funny is that i draw a parallel between first well first of all this poem in its entirety but also just kind of this section in particular to start a parallel with vafrutnismal from the poetic edda because first of all the the onus was on odin at the beginning in order to to sort of prove what he knew at the beginning and it was like all this concrete stuff but then it could go into you know deeper things later and so here we've got just you know kind of something concrete and then it's like well is there any more you know for sure and in uh that that small it was almost like odin was being like yeah i've got the basics down whereas i feel like here it's not so much like basics but like no listen to my great wisdom whereas with Odin and Vafthrudnir, there was a, there was an understanding that this was like, this was the basics that you had to have to go forward in the, in the competition. And, and that's another similarity is that, and it seems to be a, there seems to be a, a type of story where they, they share riddles or share wisdom and see who's wiser. It's kind of like flighting, but I think I think there's probably enough difference in it that it's a different form of uh, poetry and yeah, more polite. More polite, yeah. There, I'm sure there's a word for it, at least the Norse version. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's this isn't so much of like a rap battle that we've seen in other in uh, like the Lay of Harbor or anything like that. But there is a there is something there is a type of story, and you see it actually like in the Hobbit too when. Uh, Bilbo and Gollum are sharing riddles in the dark. What well, where you sort of battle wits with each other, and that's sort of what we're seeing here. Definitely, and and I mean, I think it's it's right that they were sort of proving a baseline, you know. So I mean, in some ways, Yokohainen could be doing that. He's kind of proving this baseline, but yeah, I get the well. I mean, what he says. So we didn't even touch on this. It's like he he knows this stuff in fullness with perfect clearness. Like he knows this stuff. Like he knows, knows it. Like he's presenting it as this great thing. And that, that he sees so clearly. And, and again, it's, it's just, it's just his attitude. It's not like, it's not like he is nobly proving that he's, he's got enough to contend with Bainamun. And he's, he's saying, here's what I got. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to measure up. Well, let's find out. Sounds good. This will be lines 182 
to 210. Back to the poem. Said the aged Bainamainen, Childish tales and women's wisdom, But for bearded men unsuited, And for married men unfitted. Tell me words of deepest wisdom, Tell me now of things eternal. Then the youthful Jokahainen answered in the words which follow. Well, I know whence comes the titmouse, that the titmouse is a birdie, and a snake the hissing viper, and the ruffle a fish in water, and I know that hard is iron, and that mud when black is bitter. Painful too is boiling water, and the heat of fire is hurtful. Water is the oldest medicine. Cataracts foam, a magic potion. The creator's self, a sorcerer. Yumala, the great magician. From the rock springs forth the water, and the fire from heaven descendeth. And from ore we get the iron, and in hills we find the copper. Marshy country is the oldest, and the first of trees, the willow. Pine roots were the oldest houses and the earliest pots were stone ones. So you, you can almost hear the wah wah at, at, right at the beginning when uh, Vinamoinen tells Jokahainen that every all of his great wisdom was just childish tales and, and woman's wisdom. And I think, I don't think, well, I don't know, but Woman's wisdom is actually pretty important because that's what kept the family going and the household going. And, you know, it, it would also keep the woman of the house very busy. So why would they think of, you know, the deepest w wisdom? Like they just wouldn't have the time. It would be the bearded men and the, really the bearded men who would have the, have any time because they're older and their children are probably grown up and that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, just he's just dismissing it as like the most common knowledge anyone could know in order to live in the world. Like it, so you know, worth less than nothing. Certainly, uh, if a an old man knew this, it would be pathetic. And he's saying like it's not even good enough for a married man who would need to know more in order to provide for his wife and family. So it. it I do love, he does have the great line, you know, tell me now of things eternal. So he, he's looking for, you know, the real, the real wisdom about life itself. It's the, uh, he's, he's basically asking, it's like when Odin and Bathurton and Ismael start talking about, you know, the, uh, the things in, uh, Asgard and that kind of thing. It, it's the knowledge that you would have to, you'd have to have like a, I guess wisdom would have to be your specialty. You'd have to have thought about these things. It wouldn't, it's not just surviving life. It's okay. You've, you've actually got the surviving life thing down. Now you can think about, well, you know, why am I here? And all those big questions. So, and then Yoga Heinen just goes on with like <laughs> more animals that he's seen and like, oh, the, you know, the snake will bite you and kill you. And, mud and oh boiling water that's bad like yeah okay so what else he gets a little bit into it when he talks about uh the creator's uh the creator's self a sorcerer and yumala the, the great magician but it's still just the most basic understanding of it see it's the tales that you know a mother would tell their kid about you know while they're doing their chores or whatever and uh you know, oh, mom, why is the sky blue? Well, Yumala, you know, decided one day that the sky was going to be blue, and that's why it's blue. Like, so he's not he's not saying anything new or or important here. It's the most basic things you you need to know in order to succeed in, in surviving. Right, and I and I mean again, just not to you, you know dismiss you know how how Vinyman is saying you know as far as women's wisdom goes and everything like that. I mean, like. To be clear, that that side is is certainly important here, but I, I think he's he's getting his goat. You know what I mean? He's he's kind of saying, Yogahine and like, what is this? Come on!" So I, I mean, that's that's the tone I get from this, and and you know, this is this is a 
really old set of poems. This does not reflect modern views or our own personal views or anything like that. It's just, you know, what he's saying, right? But anyway, so I, I'll give Yoko Heinen some some more credit here than previously. Like, he's at least trying to get to the why behind some things. He's trying to go for, like, okay, here is the root cause. But you know what? He's he's not going deep enough, you know what I mean? Like, this stuff is the oldest. You, you know, we, we get iron from ore. You know what I mean? Like, like that one at least is is sort of like we get iron from this thing. Like, this is this is kind of how things are made. He, it, it almost it's almost like Vayner is coaxing out the way of of the, oh, there's 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 got to be a word for it. I'm thinking of something where it's like the depth of inquiry, right? You don't want to just go for what you want to go for, why, for how, and all that. And, and maybe Vandermeulen is actually like, he's trying to coax that out. You know what I mean? Like he's trying to coax Vain, sorry, Jokaheinen, the youth into thinking with an inquiring mind and, and actually thinking about the things that are going for wisdom. And, and like, certainly their setting is a bit different, but I, I think it's like, yeah, so it's, it's good. You, you know, what all this stuff is, but now like, like go deeper. And, and I think Yoko Heinen's trying to his credit. He's, he's got a little bit more this time. Yeah, absolutely. And to be fair, like what Yoko Heinen does know is really good stuff. It It's important. He, he's obviously been paying attention and would likely, I would say, be able to take care of himself if he were sort of alone. You know, if his family died, he'd be able to figure some stuff out and that's uh like that's nothing to, to scoff at like f- for being a youth he is quite accomplished and 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 wise like he, he is absolutely wise for youth but when matched up against the combined knowledge of like culture and tradition it's not really anything because everything he knows has come from that culture and tradition right he's 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 competent enough wise enough to have the possibility even of contending with it you know but he 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 wants to skip to the end you know what i mean he wants to to get that final reward of being you know you're you're the best you get to go to the top of the dominance hierarchy that's what that really means you know if you're the one with the most wisdom with the best wisdom the the wisdom that is going to ensure the survival of the tribe of the culture that is the hero that gets put at the top of the dominance hierarchy and that is the hero that becomes the king god and i mean Vainamunin is not a god per se, at least the way we understand him here in the call of Allah, but he is the main hero. He might as well be a god. He might as well, in other pantheons and all that, he might as well be a god. He's at least in the same position here. Now, Ukko, of course, they reference, and Ukko is is absolutely like the the king god in the traditional sense, but Vainamunin is the one who is the hero and the embodiment of that, and Yokohainam wants to skip past the part where he takes his competency and the wisdom that he's growing and generating as a young person he wants to skip to the end where he's the one in control and he's the one who who gets to be the top guy and in control and in power and all that goes along with that and he just hasn't done the work and he hasn't tried out his ideas and he hasn't he hasn't taken his wisdom to the point of being useful this stuff is useful. This stuff is useful in the sense that, you know, he can survive and he's competent, but it's not useful for advancing the culture. Absolutely. And I'm trying to remember, are they, is, are, is Yuka Heinen singing this to find and women? Have we got to like, have they started singing? Well, yeah, the entire, okay. the yeah, entire it's all singing. So, sort of, but yeah. So something I'll, I'll mention too, then I'll, I'll, I'll bring up, sort of magic and singing a bit. So one of the ways of understanding, I guess, uh, magic archetypally is ordering the universe in accordance with, with your will or, well, yeah, in accordance with your ordering the universe in, in accordance with your will. So he's singing about all of this knowledge. He's, 
Yoko Hainan is obviously able to, and probably has mastered doing these things and organizing, organizing reality or, well, yeah, I guess the chaos, the un, undifferentiated chaos of nature, he is able to organize it into, you know, known territory and, you know, food and and all that kind of stuff things that he he needs to live and he's able to orient himself in the world by you know speaking these truths and and sort of uh processing the undifferentiated chaos and i i think it, i i like that that way of understanding it because you can you can see it in other myths as well like a, a lot of a lot of sort of the, the god kings even vinamoinen when they when they're organizing the chaos into into something structured and and known they're basically they're sort of speaking the truth they're they're singing the truth in a way that will organize it and i, I think that the best defense that even we have now against undifferentiated chaos is speaking the truth so that we can actually differentiate it and that's that's they're not they're not explicitly saying that but that's sort of the the power behind you know magic words or knowing magic is that you can you can order chaos in the way that you want it and the way you do that is by speaking truth and i think we're seeing that here is that speaking truth is very important i mean he's not he's he's talking about you know uh what to do with a, a snake of the, the hissing viper does not say anything like go and cuddle it and anything like that. It's, it's there. It's like, I know what to do when, you know, the viper's hissing. So, yeah, it's almost like he's gone from, he's gone from straight facts to now some things that are more like, a, a, like a little bit deeper, a little bit of the root causes, something like that. And, and you know what? He's, he hasn't brought anything new or novel to the table yet, but he's going for it. And and this is why this is so interesting here, is that this really is describing a very, very certain specific type of of person, more like a stage of development. You know, it's it's very much like he could go the way of a very, very accomplished hero. He could go that way, right? But, you know, he went for something, well... No, he he hasn't brought anything to the table yet that has done anything new. And as far as how that that goes magically, it's like so. Here are the spells that will do the things, right? But who's the one who is going to go find the spells for the first time? Who's the one who's going to go and find the magic words or the things to sing? Come up with that for the first time, and that's something different, something unique. And yeah, so far. Yoko Heinen hasn't done that. No, not at all. He's he's singing like the most common songs and spells. And and I just keep thinking, you know, if, if he had approached Vinoin and saying, like, I would like to learn from you, here's what I know. What okay, can you work with this? Like, that's a much more productive way of, of doing it than smashing the sled and trying to impress him with these basic tidbits of knowledge right and then maybe Vainamoinen can can put Yoko Heinen on a path where he can go and get some new knowledge some new information you know because I think that's the whole thing is like you a person as a youth you know the goal is to get to a point where you are actually a competent adult and being a competent adult in a lot of ways also means that you're able to deal with novel situations and handle them and and you know maybe in the in the best of circumstances, in the in the most unique of experiences, you know, the lucky ones actually get to create something brand new out of their encounter with the unknown and bring that back at, for the benefit of culture. So far, Yoko Heinen has not done that, but the potential is absolutely there. For sure. So, shall we move on? Let's move on. Okay, so this is going to be lines 211 to 234. Back to the poem. Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, answered in the words which follow. Is there more that you can tell me, or is this the end of nonsense? Said the youthful Yokohainen. Many things, 
many little things I wot of, and the time I well remember, when twas I who plowed the ocean, hollowed out the depths of ocean, and I dug the caves for fishes, and I sunk the deep abysses, when the lakes I first created, and I heaped the hills together, and the rocky mountains fashioned. Then I stood with six great heroes, I myself the seventh among them, when the earth was first created and the air above expanded. For the sky I fixed the pillars and I reared the arch of heaven. To the moon assigned his journey, helped the sun upon his pathway. To the bear his place appointed and the stars in heaven I scattered. Oh, Jokainen. So we've got we've got a kind of a typical, again, typical youth who no, I think he he at this point knows he's in trouble, and so instead of admitting, not even defeat, but just sort of uh, yielding, he's sort of gone like completely the other way and said, well, you know what? I was here at the very beginning when the, the earth was being created and I was, I was standing among, you know, sixth grade heroes and I was the seventh and all this kind of stuff that, you know, for those of us who have already read the first two runos of the Calabella, we know that this is not true. And, uh, and Vinamoyne was there for a lot of that stuff. So he would, like personally know that that's not true either. So it uh, it's funny, you know, you kind of basically bluffing and trying to trying to see if he can get away with it and boast his way out of this predicament that he I think he knows he's losing. Right, and and the whole thing here is that it takes a certain kind of hubris, really, to go and take credit for things that you don't you have not earned, right? But this is even beyond that. This is so first of all, he knows the root of creation. And I mean the the thing about that is that I think we've dealt with this before. Like some of the questions about Sudney Small are are like, you know, what's the oldest being that you remember? Something like that. And and I mean, yeah, that's that's good. That's it's good that you know the origin of things. Like that's that's almost a prerequisite to having wisdom. Then he's like, well, I did that. And I mean, I, I, I'm I, almost struggling for the exact words I'm looking for here on this because it's like he's gone and taken credit for the very existence of the world. Like in our symbological little picture that we're painting here, as far as him being an example of the new generation, that is like the new generation is saying, no, actually all of our ideas are better than everything you've done. But it's beyond that. It's like, no, we are responsible for the creation of the world. And yeah, it's it's beyond arrogance. It's beyond ignorance. It's beyond anything. This is like, and, and, and I mean, to take this into what this actually indicates, you know, like what this poem is actually saying here, as far as I'm concerned, at this point is something like, don't do this, you know, if you're, if you're trying to enact change and, and trying to, you know, bring new ideas in the world, don't do this, right? I mean, it, we don't have any consequences for that yet, but that's also like, he's taken himself to, well, he's, well, first of all, just on a factual basis, he's lying, but he's taken himself and elevated himself. Yeah, he's elevated himself to like even being the creator of the world. Like almost well, he's he's elevated himself to the place of a creator god. For and he's he, he's not earned that to to even like the, the the most basic level. But yeah, like he he's taken himself to that point and and, and I think the the parallel really is something like the new generation just elevating themselves to being like the the noblest and the wisest. And at, at the very minimum, if, if there's something like that kind of going on today or throughout history, I mean, maybe we're going to get some kind of an answer as to what happens when you do that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm just thinking like, you can definitely see it, especially like in youth when they, when they rebel, 
they think they're doing something new and incredible and it's never been done before. And, and the truth is, is it's like always been done before, but they don't see it like that. And they think they're doing something brand new and incredible. And, you know, I'm, you see it a lot, like, uh, in teens, like when they're finding their, their identity or trying to figure it out they they, you know, again, I'm using air quotes. If you're listening, uh, they create themselves and it's like, no, you no, like not even close to it. You're, you're, you're probably just copying your favorite band. Like really that's what it is. Uh, so it's, they, one, they really nailed it in the story. Like how the, how, how youth reacts to trying to figure out their own identity and how they respond to tradition and culture and all that kind of thing. And so one, that that's pretty incredible that they're able to fit that into the myth, but it's also super accurate and like, this is exactly how it goes. Yeah, definitely. Shall we see how Binding Moon is going to react? Sounds good. Okay. All right. So we're going to be doing lines 130. Sorry, 230, 235 to 254. These are bigger numbers than are in the, the Poetic Edda. Okay, back to the poem. Said the aged Bainamunin, I indeed a shameless liar. You at least were never present when the ocean first was furrowed and the ocean depths were hollowed, and the caves were dug for fishes and the deep abysses sunken. And the lakes were first created when the hills were heaped together and the rocky mountains fashioned. No one ever yet had seen you, none had seen you, none had heard you when the earth was first created and the air above expanded, when the posts of heaven were planted and the arch of heaven exalted, when the moon was shown his pathway and the sun was taught to journey. When the bear was fixed in heaven and the stars in heaven were scattered. So that's fine. I'm going in just calling him out on everything. And I think something I love about it is it shows that, you know, culture kind of has to do that when there's new and weird, you know, ideas like coming forth saying, oh, we're the greatest thing. We're where the most wise is like, well, like prove yourself. You have to prove it. And then when they don't, he's like, calls him a shameless liar. Like that, uh, those are quite literally fighting words. You know, it, I don't know as much about, uh, like Finnish society, but I, I know generally in tribal society, like calling someone a shameless liar, like if they were to kill you in response, that would be okay. That'd be kind of expected. Like that's not a, that is not a light term to be throwing around. And then going through just every one of his points about what he did and where, like witnessing the creation of this and that, and just, eh, <laughs> just calling him a liar. And, and as the reader, we know that because we've read the, the creation stories. Like we know that Jokainen was not there. So it, yeah, it's just, it's kind of, it's, almost, it's kind of painful. And when you, when you see like the, when you see youth getting, too, you know, too big for the britches, they're kind of doing this. They're basically saying like, you know, we were there at creation. We, we know what's good. We know how things work. And it's like, no, you don't, you weren't there and you're lying. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and the biggest thing that I like here that Bainamoinen does, or or more accurately doesn't do, he doesn't insert himself in there. And I mean, we also know that he's not responsible for all this stuff himself either, but he, he doesn't take credit for it either. He just, he says, you weren't there. I know you weren't there. And, and I mean, I, I think there's a nuance to that where it's like, yes, you are not responsible for your culture. And even culture and tradition kind of understands that you are not directly responsible for it but it's also like these are things that just are and it's the understanding that these are the things that just are and and maybe the the side to it here is like well no you're you're not responsible for all this stuff you, you're not responsible for the way the world is ordered you don't get any extra standing just because you say you have things right you know, so that's just a nuance to it. But yeah, Van der is calling him out without going over the top and giving himself 
a boost, which I think is is a good thing. Absolutely. Actually, I really like what uh, you said there because we actually, uh, I mean, in our society, we we afford the youth that are looking to learn, at least <laughs> I was going to say traditionally looking to learn traditions, but you know, when you're a student, especially like in university, like that, you you do carry a certain amount of respect in the way that culture looks upon you sort of happily because you're trying to learn. And so you're given a lot of a leeway to, you know, sort through sort of dumb new ideas to see like, no, this is actually what's worked. And, and if you can figure something better going forward, that's awesome. But up to now, this is what's worked. And we're going to give you the room to learn what you need to learn and to play around with some new ideas just so you can, almost so you can see why these ones have been tried before and didn't work. But you, as a student, you do get a certain amount of prestige there because there's that recognition that you're trying to learn and trying to become a functional adult and become part of the culture and society and, and keep it uh, keep it alive and even like lead it. So, yeah. So I, I mean, again, it, it just puts into to perfect relief here, kind of what the what the roles here and the divisions are here. Yokohainen is is not in a good spot. And shall we continue? Yes. This will be lines 255 to 282. Back to the poem. But the youthful Yokohainen answered in the words which follow. If I fail in understanding, I will seek it at the sword point. O oh, thou aged Vainamoinen, O oh, thou very broad-mouthed minstrel, let us measure swords together. Let the blade decide between us, said the aged Vainamoinen. I have little cause to fret me, either for your sword or wisdom, for your sword point or your judgment. But apart from this at present, I will draw no sword upon you, so contemptible a fellow and so pitiful a weakling. Then the youthful Yokine shook his head, his mouth drawn crooked, and he tossed his locks of blackness, and he spoke the words which follow. He who shuns the sword's decision, nor betakes him to his sword blade, to a swine I soon will sing him, to a snouted swine transform him. Heroes I have thus o'erpowered, hither will I drive and thither, and will pitch them on the dung hill grunting in the cow shed corner. I like this one. Uh, one, because I, I <laughs> when I was reading it, like I got the idea. Let's let us measure swords together. It just, it's, it's quite obviously very phallic. And then hearing it out loud, it, it's just it's like, wow. Okay. Yeah, this is, very phallic and, and of of course that's you know young men may not uh measure each other's phalluses to determine dominance but they there are other ways and and i mean we even at least in like western civilization we do have uh we do have phrases for this type of thing like uh like getting into like a pissing contest or it, you know i've heard uh i've heard like or dick measuring contest or you know that kind of thing so like it's a pretty it's a very common obviously has been going on forever and and it's sort of the last like okay he's he's best me at wisdom well you know what i'm more of a man than than vinamoin and and vinamoin isn't going to take the bait and you know he he's and he's got no reason to actually like fight with yuka Heinen and it also made me think of uh you know the all they'd been doing up until now was was talking or exchanging ideas and i guess singing rather than talking but still exchanging ideas there was a free flow of of information between them and they were they were putting their ideas against each other and when yokohainen's ideas weren't worthy he resorted to violence and i think that one that's a, a terrible way for uh, a culture to figure out like what what new ideas it's going to uh, move forward with. I mean, in some ways, like 
if you were to abstract this further, it's almost like an armed revolution of the of the young against the culture. And I'm not saying that that's not all that there aren't cases where that may be needed because I, I can certainly think of like just revolutions. But in general, I mean, you. I feel like there was a, a lot of room to go before they got to the point where Yukahainen would be justified in drawing his sword and, and threatening uh, Vinamoinen. And, and I, I think today, too, we see it like whenever there's a. Well, I know we've been to, a, to events where people wanted to shut it down. And they were, I think, if there had been more people, they would, there would have been violence. I mean, that's just not how. That's not how a culture is supposed to do it. We're supposed to, we're actually supposed to use words so that we don't use violence because, well, you know what? I, I will, because I was going to say, you know, using violence is uh, not good, you know, for obvious reasons, but like, let's actually go through some of the reasons. One, it's, it's volatile. You don't know how it's going to end up. Like, that's why you don't want to get into bar fights. Like you might be really good at fighting. And I've heard like Navy SEALs talk about this, who, like if there's one thing they know it's fighting and they say, yeah, like bar fights are awful because you don't know what's going to happen and you're going to get hurt no matter what. Like, even if you end up winning, you're going to get hurt. So it's not worth it. Well, a lot of the stuff that they're talking about wouldn't be worth a fight. So it make plus <laughs> it often strikes me funny that the, the people who in this day and age, uh, try and violently shut down, uh, speech of ideas that they don't like. If it were to come down to it and there's going to be like a, an actual battle, they would lose so terribly. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't even be a contest. It would be a massacre. And it's sort of their ability to shut down events and to speak, to shut down speakers and, and use violence as a tool is only, uh, it's only because the other side hasn't decided to get violent yet, which is terrifying. Like, I don't even want to think about, you know, going down the road and that happening, but that's sort of where it is. Well, and, and I mean, we, we almost had a taste of that and everything like Charlottesville is, is an actual topical example, right? Where, you know, someone died. And I mean, and that was certainly because, you know, I'm not saying that there was just provocation that's definitely not what i'm saying but but more like yeah like the the people who are generally being opposed or whatever by the by um by people trying to shut down speech or whatever like that was someone who got all the way to violence and i mean that's that's his fault and his fault alone but it's also a case of no but no no this his fault and his fault alone it's just a sort of a case of as this stuff kind of keeps progressing yeah it, it it could certainly escalate and and i mean the the whole thing here is that i i think there's a difference between challenging the traditions that are in place which in a lot of ways it you know not not to wade into this too deeply but in a lot of ways that that is what's represented by conservative politics in general that's challenging like the the traditional ideas and all that and and that's good you need to do that culture needs to do that in order to progress but then well the the <laughs> if we're looking at it from this perspective the the comeback to that is okay well how are you going to improve things? How are you going to make it better? That's what Vainamainen is doing. But then you get here, Jokahainen, you know, if Vainamainen challenges his new ideas, he's going to respond violently because I'm not saying that all new ideas, I'm not saying that all new ideas are necessarily going to be bad in the sense that you have to compel people to follow them. But I'm saying that is the attitude these days, and, I, and I'm sure this is across time because look at this. This is, you know, an old, old poem describing exactly what's going on here where new ideas have to be enforced violently in order for them to stick. And I think the point to that, and, and violence could also mean state compulsion. That could also mean like a law is compelling you to do things. And there's two sources for a law compelling someone to do things and and one i think is the the accumulated culture first of all that's often a constitution right but then it's also the things that they've 
determined are actually useful sort of thing, right? Through process and growth. And there's kind of that side to it, right? And that brings in new voices and that brings in progress and change and that brings it in and it's good. But then there's the side of things where it's like, well, we're going to change society. We're actually going to shape things. We're going to change society and we're we're going to lay some laws down. And through the laying down of these laws, people are going to change their behavior, toe the line, or else, you know, they're going to be punished. And that's the same thing. It's compelling with violence. And I mean, I, I think the idea here is that if you have to back up your ideas with violence, maybe those aren't the right ideas. Maybe they are. But there might not necessarily be so much pushback from the culture, from society, if they were good and if they were reasonable, if they were workable in the current situation. You know what I mean? Because, you know, in as many ways as there are inequalities or or things that need addressing in the world, drastic change is only going to introduce more chaos into the situation, right? I mean, like you could have a perfect world and change all the bad things all at once, but then you're going to have no idea what the heck is going to happen after that because so much has changed fundamentally and it's, and then it turns into incremental progress. And that's the side that I think culture adapts to and develops and you don't need violence to back it up. And it, I mean, it's, 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 this is the section that I just completely am blown away by on how it parallels the way ideas are discussed here and and where it's like, yeah, we kind of got this going on today. But again, I don't want to say that that progress for the progress is not a good thing and and that new ideas are not a good thing. It's just the idea of having to back it up violently in any context is I think what's wrong with it, you know? For sure. It's sort of this idea that, you know, the culture that you live in, it's not it's not monolithic. There's a lot of moving parts. And when you change one thing, it's going to have a lot of repercussions elsewhere throughout the culture. And you kind of have to, you have to account for that. That's why you do it in increments. You don't just change everything because then it's, well, it it falls apart and, and then people are no longer oriented and they don't know what's going on in the world and the world becomes a scary place. And so what are they going to do? They're going to there's going to be chaos. You're going to fight. And so that's why you need it done in, in increments, just really just to make sure that humans are able to adapt to it so that, you know, other changes can be made because you give them too much. It's not, they don't, <laughs> they, humans tend to adapt violently and, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to take much to get humans to that point where well, if I don't know what it's going to be, I'm going to kill it because then I know, at least I know I'm going to be safe. And, you know, <laughs> we don't have to go too far to to see that either in our history or, or around the world. Um, and I, I think it also shows a real, uh, I guess, tyrannical streak that if, you know, if you have ideas that, that aren't, uh, aren't convincing to, to people or the, the person you're talking to that, you're willing to compel them to believe in your ideas with violence. Like there's something you're ignoring their, uh, their autonomy to have their own thoughts. And I think, you know, that's one of those core issues. that's quite disturbing if you think about it too much, because especially in, in this day and age where you see like groups of people like this, that, you know, they're willing to be violent. Well, it means each and every one of them don't think you have the right to your own thoughts. Well, that's terrifying. And, what a good way to uh, pre- sort of like prime the pumps for for violence because people will fight back if if they really feel oppressed and like they can't have their own thoughts. Well, you're definitely going to see people fight back. Yeah, and and I mean, I think this might also be describing you know how that happens, how this develops, right? Like you get this well, basically resentful person like who right off the bat is resentful that Bayan is successful and that he's not you get that resentment and then you may, like maybe you get their best effort right like here are these ideas why aren't you believing me why aren't you putting me in charge right well if you're not going to put me in charge I'll just take my sword out and 
make you like believe or you know put me in charge will enact my ideas something like that it like it's it's that progression right where it's like it's that frustration it's that to the youthful generation it's not getting what it wants right away and so it wants to take that shortcut and and, and doesn't want to go through the work of making sure the ideas are useful and good and and applying them over time and i mean a lot of people a, a lot of people are in situations where incremental progress is you, you know it might seem like it's not necessarily going to make that big of an impact right but it's better than no impact and it's certainly better than the impact of completely tearing everything down and then just see where the chips lie because you know the funny thing is that you know maybe there's going to be a very few people after some kind of a revolution or whatever who were not so well off before that you know rise to power or whatever but i would say a lot of ordinary people are just going to be in the same bad situation as they were beforehand but anyway this all kind of ties into you know just this picture of generational conflict and dynamite and again is is kind of well he's saying like you are like not good for taking this attitude and yeah like it's it's uh it's not um it's not gonna end well i don't think for yoga heinen and, and should we maybe yeah let's see uh let's see exactly what dynamite does to him all right so this is going to be 283 to 336 back to the poem angry then was Vainamunen filled with wrath and indignation and himself commenced his singing and to speak his words of wisdom but he sang no childish ditties children's songs and women's jesting but a song for bearded heroes, such as all the children sing not, nor a half the boys can master, nor a third can lovers compass in the days of dark misfortune, when our life is near its ending. Sang the aged Bainamunen, lakes swelled up and earth was shaken, and the coppery mountains trembled and the mighty rocks resounded. And the mountains clove asunder on the shore. The stones were shivered. Then he sang of Yokohainen, changed his runners into saplings, and to willows changed the collar. And the reins he turned to alder. And he sang the sledge all gilded to the lake among the rushes. And the whip with beads embellished to a reed upon the water. And the horse with front white spotted to a stone beside the torrent. Then he sang his sword, gold hilted, to a lightning flash in heaven, and his ornamented crossbow to a rainbow o'er the water. And he sang his feathered arrows into hawks that soar above him, and his dog with upturned muzzle stands a stone in earth embedded. From his head, his cap, by singing, next became a cloud above him. From his hands, his gloves by singing, next were changed to water lilies. And the blue coat he was wearing floats a fleecy cloud in heaven, and the handsome belt that geared him in the sky as stars he scattered. As he sank, sang, sank Jokahainen, waist deep in the swamp beneath him, hip deep in the marshy meadow, to his armpits in a quicksand. Then indeed, young Jokahainen knew at last and comprehended, and he knew his course was finished, and his journey now was ended. For in singing, he was beaten by the aged Bainamainen. So it's quite, quite a dramatic song that Vainamainen has has sung and one of the things i like about it is that it it's basically like it's almost removed civilization from yokohine and like okay you want to you're upset with 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 me and tradition all that kind of stuff well okay let me take it away so you know 
the uh, the runners on the sleigh are changed back into saplings, and all of these things kind of revert into just. I was about to say useless nature. Nature is not useless, but it it's untouched nature that humans have not um, have not done any anything with. That you know, it's basically useless. I mean, he's got a a glove that uh, is a made like it's a water lily now. Like what? There's no use for humans with that, right? Like it it just doesn't work out. And all of these things that have been produced by human ingenuity and you know tamed by human ingenuity they're they're gone now and it's just it, it's as if um civilization never took hold as if agriculture never took hold it's everything's just been reverted back into their uh their raw natural state uh something else i wanted to, to mention uh just going back to the idea of magic um, and this might get a little weird, but like, let me get through it. And then I, I hope I can bring it back to not so weird. Um, so I talked a little bit before about, uh, magic being this idea that you can, uh, sort of change reality in accordance with your will. And I don't, I didn't really come up with that, that definition of, of magic. Um, I, when I was looking at this, it, it reminded me of um, something that Alan Moore said. And Alan Moore is an author. He's pretty famous more for his uh, for his comic book writing. He actually wrote something called The Watchman, which kind of introduced like comic books as art. I'm using air quotes again. If you're just listening, it's on like you know uh, Time magazines like top 10 pieces of literature in the 20th century. So it's not, it's not just like a comic book. There, there's actual substance to it. Um, and, uh, there's a great video of him on YouTube, uh, talking about when he, he turns 40 and he said, you know, Oh, and to give you an idea, one, watch the video, but Alan Moore is from uh, Northumberland. So he's got this, uh, great accent. If you're in, in North America, I mean, if you're in England, it's just, guy from Northumberland. It's not probably not that impressive, but deep voice. He's got long, long hair. He's got like a walking stick with, uh, like a snake on the top. He's got snake rings because, uh, he worships an old Roman snake God. I'm not even making this up. Like he, uh, Oh, he's got a beard, like a wizard. Like if you look up wizard in the dictionary, like th this is him. Th there's no, no doubt about it. And so he's saying, you know, I think it was for his 40th birthday, he wanted to freak everyone out and, uh, and, you know, prove that he was having a midlife crisis and reveal to his friends and family that he was indeed a magician. And at first you're like, okay, this one, you kind of believe him because he's, he's Alan Moore and he looks the way he looks. But then he goes on to talk about how, uh, creating art and specifically for him writing, he is like a magician because he takes these things that don't exist and wills them into, into reality through his writing. And then he, he goes on a bit about how spells, um, it's just like spelling and grimoires are just grammar. So the instructions on how you put the, the words that you've spelled together and that, that kind of thing. So you're watching it and you're like, okay, actually this is starting to make sense. And, it, and it's taking some of the more supernatural ideas out of magic and, and making it something that it's just another way to explain sort of the power of when you create something sort of out of your mind and bring it forth into the world. And like, you know, that's magic, not the, uh, you know, hocus pocus or whatever Harry Potter does. I'm trying to think of like a Harry Potter spell, but I, I haven't read it enough or watched the movies enough to like the Leviosa one or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, he basically talks about how there is there is magic in the world and this type of thing is is powerful and, and he goes on about like you know being able to put uh ideas into people's heads so like think of the the power of television how someone can write a, a ditty and you know you can sing it to yourself and all of a sudden you want mcdonald's and like well how did that happen well there's there's real power there 
Um, and so when I was reading this and, and reading about Vinamwinen and Yukahainen singing to each other and, and magically singing, it, it really hit home that there is, that maybe that what Alan Moore was talking about with this magic, that may, maybe magic is the right way of thinking about it. And so we, we have, um, we have, we've got Vinamwinen sort of singing everything back into its sort of pristine natural state but there's there's other ways you know they, they've got Yokohainen sinking into the mud alan moore talks about the the power of sort of the bardic magician and he he talks about how like you wouldn't want to mess with one of them because they could curse you and it might not be a curse where you turn into a frog but maybe they have written or sing a, a funny song that people make fun of you now. And now when you're in public, you know, they look at you and, and sing the song at you. Well, how terrible would that be? Like, especially in a small tribal village, that's like everyone, you know, making fun of you all the time. That's pretty awful. Well, what if they were a particularly skilled bardic magician and they wrote something that actually like lasted. So, you know, you, you die and, uh, it, the song has not only shamed you in life and in front of all your friends and family, but hundreds of years later, people are reading it and reading about how you're this, I don't know, something funny about how you walk or who knows? Like, but so now not only have you been cursed in your life, but like you're cursed for as long as people can read this work. So there is, there is like this real power and it has nothing to do with like, you know, shooting lightning bolts out of your, your fingers, but there is power in the, in, and dare I say magical power in this type of thing. And I think we're seeing an expression of that with Vinamwinen, who's able to kind of wreck Yokohainen's life in this, you know, one song because he is so skilled at all of it, at, at singing and telling stories and putting this forward. So I wanted to, Going through all this, I just wanted to address the idea of, of magic in these stories because it's easy, especially in this day and age, to, oh, magic, okay, it's a myth, it, it doesn't really matter. But no, there is actual like substance to it that that we can look at and sort of change, kind of ch if we change the way we look at something like magic in our modern age and just, you know, change it just a little bit, we can see how it would impact these stories and how you know, the magic that they're talking about isn't so different from some of the things that we have today. And it's not this crazy, you know, supernatural thing. It's, it's a weird, almost uh social thing that goes on. So, yeah. That is awesome. I'm glad it didn't get too weird. Definitely check out the Alan Moore video because he, it's honestly 45 minutes and he explains it beautifully. And yeah, 45 minutes is pretty long. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll see if we can find that and get a link. No, no, no. That that's that's amazing. And and I mean, wow. Uh, I I'm not even going to touch that. Actually, the the only the couple of things that I just wanted to say was that Yokohainen is unproven and was unable to deal with it, and he lost. Vainamainen is able to deconstruct the world around him like like literally he's able to deconstruct it and and i mean that that speaks to kind of on a almost metaphysical level he understands how the world is and is able to influence it exactly i don't have anything more than that because that was actually really really cool and yeah i i, I wish i had something as intelligent to to bring to this particular point and i don't so that's that's all i got <laughs> well we can move on because it get, does get cool again yeah definitely yeah. <laughs> and uh this is this is going to be a record here we're, we're going to go over a hundred lines this is uh this is going to be quite something here so lines 336 to 440 back to the poem he would raise his foot to struggle but he could no longer lift it then he tried to lift the other but as shod with stone he felt it then the youthful Yokohainen felt the greatest pain and anguish, and he fell in grievous trouble. And he spoke the words which follow. 
O thou wisest Vainamoinen, O thou oldest of magicians, speak thy words of magic backwards and reverse thy songs of magic. Loose me from this place of terror and release me from my torment. I will pay the highest ransom and the fixed reward will give thee. Said the aged Vainamoinen, What do you propose to give me if I turn my words of magic and reverse my songs of magic? Loose you from this place of terror, and release you from your torment, said the youthful Yokohainen. I have two crossbows I could give you. I, a pair of splendid crossbows. One shoots forth with passing quickness, surely hits the mark, the other. If it please you, choose between them, said the aged Dainamainen. No, your bows I do not covet. For the wretched bows I care not. I myself have plenty of them. All the walls are decked with crossbows. All the pegs are hung with crossbows. In the woods they wander hunting. Nor a hero needs to span them. Then the youthful Yokohainen. In the swamp he sang yet deeper. Said the youthful Yokohainen, I have yet two boats to offer, splendid boats, as I can witness. One is light and fit for racing. Heavy loads will bear the other. If it please you, choose between them, said the aged Dainamainen. No, your boats I do not covet, and I will not choose between them. I myself have plenty of them. All the staves are full already. Every creek is crowded with them. Both boats to face the gale adapted, boats against the wind that travel. Then the youthful Yokohainen, in the swamp he sang yet deeper, said the youthful Yokohainen, I have still two noble stallions, I, a pair of handsome horses, one of these of matchless swiftness, and the other best in harness. If it please you, choose between them, said the aged Dainamainen. No, I do not want your horses. Do not need your steeds, white-footed. I myself have plenty of them. Every stall has now its tenant, every stable's filled with horses, with their backs like water shining, lakes of fat upon their haunches. Then the youthful Yokohainen, in the swamp he sang yet deeper, said the youthful Yokohainen, O thou aged Vainamainen, speak thy words of magic backwards, and reverse thy songs of magic. I will give a golden helmet and a hat filled up with silver, which my father won in warfare, which he won in battle struggle, said the aged Vainamainen. No, I do not want your silver, and for gold I only scorn it. I myself have both in plenty. Every storeroom crammed with treasure, every chest is overflowing. Gold as ancient as the moonlight, silver with the sun coeval. Then the youthful Yokohainen, in the swamp he sang yet deeper. Said the youthful Yokohainen, O thou aged Bainamainen, loose me from this place of terror and release me from my torment. All my stacks at home I'll give thee, and my fields I likewise promise, all to save my life I offer, if you will accept my ransom said the aged Dainamainen. No, your barns I do not covet, and your fields are neath my notice. I myself have plenty of them. Fields are mine in all directions. Stocks are reared on every fallow, and my own fields please me better, and my stacks of corn are finest. So we have Yokohainen pleading with Vinamoinen to undo the the magic that he has done that's that's wrecked everything for him and he then offers all of these things for ransom and the the irony is that all of the things he offers Vinamoinen are things that Vinamoinen already has and all already has the best of and it's all of these things that that the culture, that the civilization would have provided Yokohainen in the first place. And as a, you know, as a young man, he's got 
he's got some weapons and, and some boats and that kind of thing, but nothing of great value. It's not until uh, really the thing that he offers of the greatest value is the uh, the golden helmet and the hat filled with silver. And that's not even his to offer. It's his father's who won it in uh, in battle, which really shows you that Jokahainen hasn't done anything worthwhile yet that is that's made him worthy of of challenging the the status quo i would i would say and that he you know at at any point he actually has to uh use something that his father has given or at least has provided for him uh to offer anything that's even like remotely at least to the reader that would be remotely uh like interesting. I mean, Vinamoinen doesn't care because he's got all the gold he can ever have, but um, it just really shows like if you go in against the culture arrogantly and ignorantly, it's going to smack you down and it like super hard and it doesn't even care. Like it, it's just going to roll over you. So there is a, I'd say a call to 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 uh you know respect and to uh i guess embracing the culture so that you can have a foundation beneath you so that you can do things that might change it for the better right i, I think there's something to the idea of say culture tradition whatever word you want to use for it it doesn't need anything that you have to offer in your time of desperation you know it's like Anything that you have to offer is already kind of going to going to be there, unless you you already have something novel and new, right? And that's that's kind of the the point, you know what I mean? Yokohina doesn't have that, and and I think here, I mean, first of all, he starts off with crossbows, right? And I mean, that's interesting because that's like the ability to hit the mark. That's that's where the word sin comes from. Is like is like an archery term, and if, if you don't hit the target, you're sinning. And so, I mean, a crossbow that always hits the mark. That's like that's something, but you know what? The culture's already kind of figured that out. You know what I mean? Like it's it's already gone to the point where it can hit the mark on a lot of things. It's got crossbows all over. It can hit the mark on a lot of things. It can travel. It's got boats, right? It can travel. You know, it it can it can travel by horse. Like it 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 can spread its influence wide. It's got fields. It can. It's it's got treasure. It's it's got it's got you, you know, gold and silver, it's not necessary, right? It's not necessary to have that, those riches sort of thing. But it's like, yeah, it's got its extravagance. Like anything that you can you can offer as a as a member of the culture in your desperation to save your life. I mean, I mean, that's almost like <laughs> you, you could you could look at that cynically. Certainly you could look at that cynically because that's something like yeah, it it should it should say something like, Yeah, you, you really don't have that much standing in the culture, in the hierarchy, until you've proven yourself and worked your way up there, right? And and I mean, that could be disheartening for someone where it's like, well, it's it's going to be really hard to do that. And it's like, well, yeah, it's going to be really hard to do that. And and I, I think it is something like a warning, like don't get yourself onto the bad side of your, your culture, your tradition, like don't make it want to kill you in a literal or figurative sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it, it's funny, like in some ways, that's what. Uh, just going back to the the magic thing, that's what Vine Wynn has kind of done. Is he's he's set the the power of culture, not even against him, but like taking it away and said, okay, like now what? And uh, and he he's trying to offer all these things that he oh here's what I can provide the culture that I now want to be in. But Vine was like, we've got all this stuff, like. Uh, what I like, do you have? Yeah, I really like that as as far as it's like, yeah, but you, you like that you, you you hate this culture so much. Let's take everything away that this culture has produced for you. Like that's, I don't think anyone these days could survive without all the, well, m most people, most young people who rail against society could not survive without the creature comforts they have today. Just like make one law that says something like. You have to be 21 to have a, an iPhone done. Like, oh, could you imagine? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, 
the layers to this story, it's, it's, it's quite something and the parallels to modern society. It's quite something. And now that Yoko Heinen has offered pretty well everything he's got, let's, uh, let's see if there's anything else he has to offer. Sounds good. All right, lines 441 to 466. Back to the poem. Then the youthful Yoko Heinen. In the swamp he sang yet deeper. Then the youthful Yoko Heinen felt at length the greatest anguish. Chin deep in the swamp while sinking. In the mud his beard was draggled. In the moss his mouth was sunken. And his teeth among the tree roots. Said the youthful Yokohainen, O oh, thou wisest Vainamainen, O oh, thou oldest of magicians, sing once more thy songs of magic, grant the life of one so wretched, and release me from my prison. In the stream my feet are sunken, with the sand my eyes are smarting. Speak thy words of magic backwards, break the spell that overwhelms me, you shall have my sister Aino, I will give my mother's daughter. She shall dust your chamber for you, sweep the flooring with her besom, keep the milk pots all in order, and shall wash your garments for you. Golden fabrics she shall weave you, and shall bake you cakes of honey. So now we have Yoko Heinen actually offering something that is that might be useful. I guess we'll, I'll address first, you know, offering his sister. Um, at the time, that was fairly typical. Like husbands would marry off their daughters, or, uh, or you know, the father was gone, the, the brother, the, the man of the house would do it. That's a, a fairly typical uh, transaction. It, marriage wasn't, uh, marriage was sort of a, an agreement between families, one that would hopefully bring peace and prosperity and also uh, provide children for the, for everyone, for the continuation of the tribe and species. And, uh, it's only like fairly recently where love was the criteria for choosing a mate before then it was usually some sort of, uh, like bargain or mo monetary thing or something with wealth. So just to sort of get that out of the way so that when I talk about it, I'm not coming off as callous as, as you know, we should be selling, you know, trading women off like uh, cows or whatever. It's just they were, and that's what it's referring to. But the the benefit that Yoko Heinen is, is providing to Vinamoinen is that that potential for growth. That's exactly like this whole thing Yoko Heinen hasn't hasn't shown any potential for growth hasn't really offered anything to the society or the culture until this point where he says well actually I've got this I've got the sister who you know the feminine who would match up with your mat with your um, masculine energy and you know you could actually like move forward and maybe move forward more quickly you know with her and uh and so I, I think that's the, the symbolism behind offering, offering the sister. And from what I could tell, the the name I know, it means uh, only one. And uh, I'm not well. We haven't seen why that might be uh, interesting to the story yet, but I think at some point we will. And uh, and yeah, so he's. He's actually offering Vinamwen what he wants at the very end is that 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 potential, right? Because Vinamwen, I mean, he he might be on his track and everything like that, but I, I mean, there, there's sort of a limit you can go without changing things up, right? Just kind of in general. Uh, yeah, Aino is 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 only that's still like it's not the word for for only in 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 Finnish. Ainoa is, but Aino was the original poetic form which means only daughter so that was like the original poetic form and then i know came from that that's my understanding anyway but the thing about this here so okay this is going to be my main rabbit hole for the evening awesome so 
And I'm going to preface this with, I certainly might be getting this wrong because I've, I've tried to find as many sources on this as possible and wrapping my head around it has been something. But okay, so the Finnish conception of the soul and the idea of self as I understand it. So there are three traditional parts to the Finnish soul. And before I even get into that, that's a concept that that does come up a lot in societies like this. And there's parallels drawn between the um, the Finnish conception of the soul and say the Norse conception of the soul, that there is ideas of different parts of the soul in the Norse. We haven't covered that, but that's just something there. There are parallels to them anyway. So the three parts of the Finnish soul. So you have the itse, that translates to self. Even today, that's the word for self. And that's really kind of the idea of the unique individual personality of someone. And so, I mean, when when you think of the soul, when you think of someone's soul, I think that's the primary part that you, you think of. Like, that's the part that makes you, you. That's the part that makes yourself. Then there's the henki. And that means breath. And this is given at birth and this is given at birth to not given this is like this is like a part of you from birth and it's it's all the the warmth and that sort of that energy kind of below the personality that that's kind of all all there and it's almost capable of all the the potential of the person separate from you know the the individualized self that is the personality and how they act in the world something like that it, this is kind of like something deeper then last is luonto or nature and this is specifically considered to be kind of like a guardian spirit something kind of detached from the self and capable of of travel apart from the person the way i understand it but the idea of having a part of yourself as being nature to me that says something like that is the culture guarding the person the individualized self backed up by this breath all kind of as a tripartite thing and that is the person that's capable of acting in the world capable of acting on the the potential but also acting within culture so here bringing it back to the story the way i read this story the way i read the concept of the soul in the context of this sort of this story is that yokahainen is this individualized self that is warring against nature for whatever reason or maybe the most natural reason you know like how it's natural as we've said to for the new generation to kind of want to change things up sort of thing. Maybe that maybe that's maybe that's a conflict. Maybe that's a personalized conflict sort of thing. But now he's giving up his breath. He's giving up the very part of the essence of his family which maybe could be seen as a larger version of the self, you know. Concepts of the family I think were a bit different. You have the individualized self but then maybe like there's a the family is maybe that larger whole, you know. And in the process of warring against his own nature, he's willing to give up his breath, his hengi, in the form of his sister, to to survive, to live on, to whatever. It, it almost seems purposeless. And yeah, it, it to me, it's like he's offering all the potential of his family for his own failures and he's even willing to give up the potential of his self and his personality that's my reading of it anyway yeah that sounds uh that sounds awesome and again i i could be wrong on this especially because when i was initially reading it i couldn't quite tell who was the itse and who was the hanky i knew who the nature was that's basically vainamun in this story if we're looking at it from this context but the concepts of self and breath are a, a little bit more complicated than I'm making it. And if you have any sources on this that I might not have seen, I would love to hear about it. Not an expert in this stuff at all. This was just something kind of cool that came up in, in researching all of this. 
And uh, incidentally enough, one of the better sources that I found to kind of corroborate this was uh, a source talking about the religion of the Hanti Mansi people. Which, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, coincidentally, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we know someone who who knows uh, a little bit about that. Uh, if you want to go uh, um, listen to the interview uh, of ours with uh, Tomas Ronakari, that was a great, great time. And he uh, he talks a bit about the, the Hanti people specifically and their some of their myths and stuff. So that that was pretty cool just to see that parallel. That's awesome. And that was a great time. <laughs> yeah, it was. Episode 19. But yeah, that that's that's my reading here is that he's he's willing to not just give up his sister, he's he's giving up like a part of his personality. He's giving up the potential of the family of the self, all of that. So it's 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 deeper. It's much deeper. It's kind of like and, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong at least for your interpretation, it's kind of like how if you want to fit into society, you have to allow yourself to be oppressed at a, at a certain level so that you can, so that you can fit in and enjoy the benefits of being in society. And, you know, maybe, yeah, no, no, no. And, and, and that's, that's great because like he's, he's, it's like he's submitting to society, but he only has to do that because he's he's raged against it so heavily you know what i mean like he's he's gone against it and lost and now he has to give up the possibility potentially as he has to go in and conform wow yeah and it's like the potential if he was free of society of culture you've got limitless potential i guess or you've got ultimate freedom so you've got sort of limitless potential, but to actually realize that potential is ridiculous. Like how would you even do that? So he, he's giving up that idea of like limitless potential in order to be taken back into the fold of, of society. Yeah. In order to just survive. Just to survive. Well, that's why, I mean, if you want to really uh, mess with someone, you'd outlaw them. And, you take away the protection of, of the culture and society from them. And that was a death sentence. So, yeah. Yeah. This is, this has been a pretty cool little, uh, little thing here. And, and this, and I say that because I, I didn't know how exactly this would all fit, but I'm glad this is, this is all making sense. Should we, uh, kind of bring this on home here? Yeah, I think so. There's not a lot left. There's certainly a couple of things that we'll, we'll touch on, but, uh, the story is concluding shortly. Lines 467 to 492. Back to the poem. Then the aged Vainamoinen heard his words and grew full joyful, since to tend his age was promised Yokohainen's lovely sister. On the stone of joy he sat him, on the stone of song he rested, sang an hour and sang a second, and again he sang a third time. Thus reversed his words of magic and dissolved the spell completely. Then the youthful Yokohainen from the mud his chin uplifted, and his beard he disentangled from the rock his steed led forward, drew his sledge from out the bushes, from the reeds his whip unloosing. Then upon his sledge he mounted, and upon the seat he sat him, and with gloomy thoughts he hastened, with a heart all sad and doleful, homeward to his dearest mother. Unto her, the aged woman. On he drove, with noise and tumult. Home he drove in consternation, and he broke the sledge to pieces. At the door, the shafts were broken. So we see him wrecking his sledge again. <laughs> but kind of for different reasons. I think uh, Vinamoinen is, is joyful because he he's going to be able to marry uh, I know, so that's that's great for him. But for Yokohain, and that I think you can see him preparing to give up that that freedom and that potential that he would have outside of outside of the culture. He, he's recognizing that he is going to have to submit, and and so. He's not going to have that ultimate freedom and that, that he lost, you know, he went up against it and 
he ultimately had to uh had to yield he he came out on the losing end of that and yeah he's just he's heading home with his tail between his legs and you know getting ready to deliver the news to his family that his sister is now going to have to go marry Vinamwin and the thing here too it's like he he's dealing with these consequences so immaturely like his sledge just got remade you know and i mean Vinamwin just showed his full power not only can he deconstruct everything he can put it back together right so like yeah Vinamwin's got it going on right like he is the master of civilization but yeah maybe that's the one thing he doesn't have is that reinvigoration right and so again if we're being cynical about this something like that how you know the powerful Vinamwin takes it from like the young upstart yoke behind he takes all his potential something like that but I think the, the the metaphor is deeper than that. It's something like society, culture in general takes that, but it's 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 like Jokahainen doesn't want to do that yet. He's not he's not there. He's not ready. His contribution hasn't hasn't matured. Something like that, and so he's angry. And yeah, he, he goes home. He gets rescued, but but he's angry, and, and it's like. Again, it's like the reaction to defeat. It's it's resentful. It's it's angry. It's yeah. It's not great. No, no, no. And that's exactly it. It's like it's kind of like he's realized he's going to have to be an adult, and that he can't just spend his time doing whatever and you know hanging out on a patio drinking beers. Like he's going to have to do a lot of the things that are expected of him if he wants to uh, participate in the culture and, and reap the benefits. Uh, at the same time, you know, I think Vinamwena recognizes that if any part of him is going to uh, continue on, he's going to need like an offspring. And I know is the, is sort of the key to that. Whereas, you know, cause they talk about him, being uh, old and steadfast all the time so we do and, and that things are sort of wrapping up so he's he's looking for that way to continue on at least uh at least his legacy for for it to continue on yeah it, the, the whole thing is is kind of it's coming together here there's certainly a winner and a loser but uh should we see yeah, how things kind of so yeah so this is going to be lines 493 to 536 almost done two left here not that we're in a rush but you know back to the poem then the noise alarmed his mother and his father came and asked him recklessly the sledge was broken did you break the shafts on purpose wherefore do you drive so rashly and arrive at home so madly then the youthful Jokahainen could not keep his tears from flowing Sad he bowed his head in sorrow, and his cap awry he shifted, and his lips were dry and stiffened, or his mouth, his noise, nose was drooping. Then his mother came and asked him, Wherefore was he sunk in sorrow? Oh, my son, why weep so sadly? Oh, my darling, why so troubled, with thy lips so dry and stiffened, or thy mouth, thy nose, thus drooping? Said the youthful Yokahainen, O oh, my mother, who has borne me, there is cause for what has happened, for the sorcerer has overcome me. Cause enough have I for weeping, and the sorcerers brought me sorrow. And I myself must weep forever, and my pa must pass my life in mourning. For my very sister, I you know, she, my dearest mother's daughter, I have pledged to Vainamainen as the consort of the minstrel to support his feeble footsteps and a weight upon him always. Joyous clapped her hands his mother. Both her hands she rubbed together, and she spoke the words which follow. Do not weep, my son, my dearest, for thy tears are quite uncalled for. Little cause have we to sorrow, for the hope I long have cherished, for the hope <clears throat> all my lifetime I have wished it, and have hoped this high-born hero might akin to us be reckoned. And the minstrel Vainamainen 
might become my daughter's husband. So I wonder if uh, Yoko Heinen was kind of surprised when his mother was uh, delighted that his da- her daughter would be marrying Vinam I mean, he, he comes in, like, you can just see him. He's ugly crying. He, he's just, he's a mess. And he comes in and tells his mother, like, oh, I've, you know, I've kind of lost our daughter. You know, I, I had to trade her to live. And his mother's like, this is fantastic. Like, Vinam Wynn's wonderful. He's got, he's got this, st- like, he's got it going on. Like, she, my daughter's going to be okay. Like, you know, everything is uh, going to work out. Um, and I think it's the idea that, like, I think she recognizes the need for one for like culture and society to be rejuvenated and to have that uh, sort of counterbalance of sort of the mysterious chaos that the feminine provides. But also, uh, you know, for her daughter, the, the stability that the, the masculine provides and the culture provides that, that it, you know, she's going to be in a place where danger doesn't lurk around every corner. It's sort of nicely behind the, the walls of the, of the house or whatever. So the, I can definitely see why the mother would be happy over this. Right. And, and I mean, I, I think the whole thing here is that, you know, it's a, it's a difference in perspective, right? It's a difference in perspective from, you know, the, the young gung ho Yokohine and, and, and the, prior generation that wants to see you know a positive outcome kind of in the future but i mean if we're, if we're kind of taking this here i mean yoko Heine maybe still has kind of a, a point where it's like yeah we, we also have to give this up like she's no longer going to be be with them right and and i mean it, it's it yeah it's, it's different perspectives and and Vinamarin is certainly well he's the top guy right like who who wouldn't want to choose Vinamarin and i and i mean that sort of that's sort of the whole thing here is that, you know, maybe with the the wisdom and foresight of, you know, being a mother and being like kind of that older generation, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, he's he's a good pick. You should pick him sort of thing. But who knows how I know it's going to react. Exactly. Shall we? Let's do it. All right. This will take us to the end here. So this is 537 to 580. Back to the poem. But when Yokohainen's sister heard, she wept in deepest sorrow, wept one day and wept a second at the threshold, ever weeping, wept in overwhelming sorrow in the sadness of her spirit. Then her mother said, consoling, Wherefore weep, my little Aino? You have gained a valiant bridegroom and the home of one most noble, where you'll look from out the window, sitting on the bench and talking. But her daughter heard and answered, O oh, my mother, who hast borne me, therefore have I cause for weeping, weeping for the beauteous tresses now my youthful head adorning, and my head so soft and glossy, which must now be wholly hidden, while I still am young and blooming. Then must I, through lifetime sorrow for the splendor of the sunlight, and the moonbeam's charming luster and the glory of the heavens, which I leave while still so youthful, as a child must quite abandon. I must leave my brother's workroom just beyond my father's window, said the mother to the daughter. To the girl, the crone made answer, cast away this foolish sorrow. Cease your weeping all uncalled for. Little cause have you for sorrow, little cause for lamentation. God's bright sun is ever shining on the world in other regions shines on other doors and windows than your father's or your brother's. Berries grow on every mountain. Strawberries on the plains are growing. You can pluck them in your sorrow, wheresoe'er your steps may lead you, not alone on father's acres or upon your brother's clearings. So we have, uh, I know, upset that she is going to be married off to Finamoyan and, and uh, the mother basically making the case for why this is actually awesome for her, uh, including be, you know being able to pick berries on the mountain. I like that part; it uh, paints a nice picture. But what I see of it is that 
and she talks a little bit about it, how she's still youthful and, you know, still, uh, still young and blooming. She, she has that, that potential that, that she can go anywhere. She can sort of do anything she wants right now. And she's going to be married off to Vinamoinen, who is essentially the, you know, the tr- tradition and culture and, and sort of the thing that would take that ultimate freedom away and sort of curtail it to freedom but not not that ultimate one where she can just sort of do whatever she wants and i think she's uh i think that's what she's she's mourning and and upset about and and actually this uh, particular motif of sort of a woman who uh doesn't or is displeased with her suitors is a a fairly common uh motif throughout the world and, and in uh just in mythology um you can see it. Uh, Joseph Campbell talks a lot about it in his, uh, in a lot of his works. And, uh, it's kind of this idea that there is a, there is a sacrifice to be made, but also, and you have to be, especially for a woman, you have to be worried about what you're sacrificing and to, and to who or whom. I'm not sure. Either way, they have to worry about, that because they're going to be connected with this man like legally and spiritually and and culturally i mean if they if they just sort of leave then they're that they they feel the brunt of that um i mean in in this case it would be like it's culturally enforced monogamy which you know seems to have, have worked traditionally throughout the cultures but uh but there's a there's a price to pay and Vinamoinen's old enough that he recognizes that it is quite worth the price it, for for a good wife. Whereas I, I think with uh, I know she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't see it that way for sure, and she's still quite young. So it it seems like quite uh, like quite the the set of shackles to be put upon her. Yeah, it's it's interesting seeing all the reactions, right? So, so y- the younger generation is is sort of universally opposed to this, whereas the older generation is is pretty happy with it, and it's just sort of like they see the long view as to what the benefits are versus Yoka Heinen and I know really don't see what's going to be good here. But I think that's that's also right, where it's kind of like she's not ready; she hasn't gone and made the choice, and and. While you were talking, I was I was kind of thinking like maybe maybe a good way to to look at these parts of the soul here is kind of like we almost have the idea of the head and the heart where though they they can be acting separately and have different motivations and things like that and you know your head can do one thing your heart can do another well well in this case the heart doesn't want to kind of kind of do this the heart's not in it and really just on a purely symbolic level that's like there isn't that full commitment required to make it work the the potential that i know has might not necessarily work out because she hasn't chosen she hasn't gone and made that choice even though it maybe if she had the opportunity properly she would pick dynamine and maybe she well, may, well, maybe she wouldn't, right? But it, I think the other point is like it, she, she's not ready. She's not at, at the right time. Circumstances have forced this, right? Yoka Heinen's actions have forced this. And, and maybe to try and tie this back into, you know, kind of society in general, like maybe the price of, of going against society, culture, tra- tradition in general is you have to give up kind of your your heart your hopes and dreams and that's that's dark man like that's yeah i was just gonna say that uh this took a gloomy turn wow i didn't i didn't mean to but i i want to tie it back to the positive implied by that is sort of like if you work with society maybe you won't have to give that up you know what i mean i think that's the implication I think that's the implication here of this entire poem is that, you know, if if you go and rail against society and just want to tear it down and destroy it and all that, there could be a 
a price to pay it. And, you know, if you don't die, just straight die, maybe you don't survive in a way that's worth living. Ooh, sorry again. (laughs) Yeah, this is, uh, but no, those are the stakes. Like, and that's why like her mother's like, no, this is a good deal. Like, because you don't have to give up all of your, you know, all of your hopes and dreams or anything like that. You just have to curtail it a certain amount so that you can live in peace with the people around you. Well, maybe they're, they're just so forlorn or whatever, because again, as you were saying, like they don't have the freedom to just go whatever they do, whatever they want. Now the hopes and dreams, the heart, the breath has to be, you, you know, it has to be put into service of society. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And who wants to do that? If you're not ready for it, if you're not ready for it. Yeah. Well, I couldn't think of a better moment to close. No, I think that's uh, I think that's a good spot. No, this has been a a really interesting poem here. Honestly, like this one, this one had layers to it, huh? Oh yeah, this was this was great because on the surface of it, it's a pretty one. It's just entertaining, like a vinyl one. Get, we're getting to see him get into action and sort of show why he's you know the the top of the food chain, top of the dominance hierarchy against some young upstart which is actually one of my favorite types of stories where the, you know, the old veteran has to, you know, show the young whippersnapper who's who. And, you know, I would like one, one of my favorite stories, let's say is, is, uh, like Rocky five. Yeah. That's the one with, uh, Tommy gun, right? Tommy machine gun. I think so. Yeah. Not, not the one with, uh, Ivan Drago, which is also great, but Rocky five, it, it's not the best movie, but the story behind it where like, you know, Rocky's protege wants to show Rocky up and Ro- Rocky has to like, you know, teach him a thing or two that like, I live for that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, so no, this was like, I, I love the story. And and then the, the meanings behind it were fantastic. Yeah. They were good today. Your, your entire thing on magic. That was, that was something, man. That was really good. It, it definitely helped explain a lot of the things that are that are going on. Lots to think about for sure. Oh, thanks. I loved your uh, your soul part, so that it actually it added a really awesome layer because it it went from like it was one of those things where it started the story started working on a whole bunch of different levels, and I love when that happens. So yeah, that's that's yeah. definitely our gem. I, I hope I hope I got it right. So we'll we'll see. But it made sense though, right? Yeah. Totally. So there we go. Well, I guess we'll uh, we'll close things out on that note, and uh, I think we'll just uh, you know our our housekeeping. We'll reiterate everything. Uh, yeah, the, if you want to support the podcast, the the biggest way you can do that is to share with friends, family, social media. That's the biggest single way you can share. Uh, you can help us is to is to share. That's that's big. That's huge for us. Uh, and we're always appreciative of uh, any comments on our social media. Connect with us. We're under either Northern Myths or Northern Myths Podcast on everything. We're Facebook slash Northern Myths. We're at Northern Myths on Twitter. We're Northern Myths Podcast on Instagram. We're both personally on Twitter at North Myth Luke and at North Myth Dan. So come connect with us. We're always happy to talk. Definitely, uh, we we try and you know connect with everyone who who reaches out to us. Always happy to hear someone listens to the show other things that uh, are helpful you know if, if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a review if you're on itunes or apple podcasts or uh, a rating on on facebook or anything like that that's super helpful if you're on youtube always appreciate a subscribe or liking the video and uh yeah check out our youtube channel if you're just listening on the podcast we're we're doing some interesting things trying to make some good clips of the show kind of get some shorter uh moments from the show that talk about something in particular and we run a, a weekly have all series so there's there's that but uh and I think the only thing that I want to mention uh, for this episode, for the you know when this episode is originally released, uh, you know from our our uh, our episode with uh, Tuomas Ronakari of of Corpi Klani. Well, the new Corpi Klani album is going to be coming out shortly. That comes out September seventh, twenty eighteen. It's called Kulkia, means wanderer. 
we're nothing but excited for it. And uh, yeah, that's that's when it comes out. And they've got a North American tour coming out uh, right after this. So if you're in North America, they got lots of dates across uh, across the U.S. and Canada, and, and we'll be there when they're uh, when they're in our town. So absolutely, and the uh, the new album is getting incredible reviews. Like they're uh, they're calling this one like the classic, like Corbaclani. Like in ten years, when you th- when people ask about Corbaclani, it'll be this album that they point people to. So definitely uh, get your hands on it when uh, when it's released. Exactly, and uh, you know if you're listening, you know right on the day we're releasing this episode. If you're listening right today, you can go check out. Uh, they've got I think four now music videos from this album on uh, on YouTube already. And my personal favorite is Hank Selly Poikov. Really, really, really good music video. So you can check all that out. We'll we'll put links in the in the the notes and the YouTube description and all that uh, in case you want to check it out. But uh, yeah, other than that, uh, yeah, we just want to support uh you know tuomas and and Corpiclani because you know he was so awesome being on the show we we just wanted to make sure you all know about uh about Corpiclani's new album so absolutely uh okay and i think that pretty much does it uh unless i'm forgetting anything uh well i think there there's only one thing left to uh to do and uh that's to go find the myth you're living This has been the Northern Myths Podcast. Thanks for listening.